Hello everyone. Actually, hello world. Welcome to my channel. My name is Amanda and this is my first ever video. It, it's good that I started with something short and manageable, isn't it? Oh well. As it is my first video, I'll start with a little introduction. You can skip it if you want. At least I hope I will have figured out how to put chapters in YouTube or at the very least to put timestamps in the description so you can jump around to your heart's content. So what's the premise of this channel? I am an amateur writer. It is my passion in life. So when I learned that there was a book side of YouTube, I knew that I had to contribute in some way. And it took a long time to come up with a workable idea and then it took even longer to execute it but we're here finally and the, and the idea is as follows i am a pretty fast reader but i still spend a lot of time on every book i read and that's because whenever i come across a particularly good line or a questionable one i pause and take the time to write it down in one of these. And I do this because I want to get as much as possible out of my reading experience. In order to evolve my own language, I have to examine and evaluate why I like what I like and why I don't what I don't. Though, <laughs> pretty often when I, I find a questionable line, and subsequently look it up, I learned that it's not questionable, it's me who's wrong. But whenever that happens, I learn something. So it works really well. I've been doing it for years and quite often I do feel that I would just like to read a book and not be bothered. But whenever I try to do that, I feel like I'm missing out. I'm just a sucker for clever or pretty use of language. It is literally my favorite thing in the world. So I thought, why not share that with all of you? By which, of course, I mean, thanks for watching, Dad. Despite the genre and the language, I really appreciate it. Um, I have, it is my first video. But I have figured out that the almighty algorithm likes it, if you would watch it through to the end. I am going to read as well as show all of the relevant quotes, so it should be fully listenable. I hope. That's the goal, at least. And, of course, thank you so much to anyone else who's watching just to support. It, I appreciate all of you. It means the world to me. So let's go then. I have decided to start off this series with June by Frank Herbert. Now a major motion picture. Uh, and I, I show June, a science fiction, despite the fact that I almost exclusively read and write fantasy myself. And I chose it because I have a relationship with the story. I had the 2000 TV miniseries on tape growing up. I watched it over and over, loved it. It is one of the reasons I went down the fantasy sci-fi route. And I have the knowledge of having read the book before. I don't remember when, but going by how few of the details I remembered, I think it was when I was just about good enough at English to confirm the plot points from the miniseries. And while it was a long time since I saw the miniseries, some images from it are just ingrained in my mind. For instance, whenever there is a scene with Paul, the protagonist, uh, and his raven black hair, this is what I imagine, which isn't even close. Um, and it took a while to make myself imagine the spice blue eyes as inky dark rather than shining neon from some camera angles. But I, I got there eventually. And th that is 
the only adaptation I've seen. Because um, I um, I heard that the David Lynch adaptation uh, deviated a lot from the plot. And I thought that I, why, I already had the miniseries, so why should I dilute it with something less good? And the movies, the new movies, are... I'm, I'm gonna see them at some point. But it's on the agenda, at least. Um, I've been wanting to reread it for years and years. But this is not the edition I've had on my shelves waiting for me. But... This one. Now I have two editions of June. Because I always knew that I was gonna read it twice for this video. So I started with the one I had. And then I went and bought this one in a series of three for future videos. So subscribe for more June content eventually at some point. It's gonna happen, I, it will, I, I promise. And for some reason, when I read this, it I didn't make a note that this American author has written in British English, somewhat British English. I just took that in stride. And I only noticed it when I read it again in this new edition because this is written in American English which meant that I had to change all of the quotes I had already written down you know for consistency this is American those are gonna be in American English it should all be the same and um, it wasn't a hardship I'm not complaining I was gonna double and triple check everything anyway but still there were also some spelling errors in this one, like grammatical errors or more like type, common typos. And those are corrected in this American edition. But you know, you always have to appreciate seeing a spelling error in professional print. Because then you can see, you spot it and you can imagine that you have all the qualifications for being an editor for a little while. It's not true, but that would be fun, wouldn't it? At least you wouldn't you wouldn't have made that mistake. So, and you, you have to enjoy the small things in life. You know, small pleasures, especially the petty ones. I named this series Micro Appreciation because we're gonna get into the nitty gritty here. And I do plan to make it a series. There will be more of these. I'll even try to work faster on the coming ones. The books themselves are shorter, so that part at least is, won't take as long. Uh, I'll do my best. And, uh, well, in the case of this book at least, there will be some macro appreciation thrown in here, because this is a great book. That's not a hot take from me. Lots of people have said it since it was first published in 1965. If you want to read Dune, uh, and you're discouraged by spoilers, then don't watch this video until you read it. Then come back and watch so we can appreciate it together. Um, that would be nice, wouldn't it? I think that's what I want most out of this channel, at least. I would enjoy it. It is internally divided into three books. I'll try to put chapters for those because this is gonna be a long video. I don't know if I'll... Uh, I have the energy to film all of it tonight, but I'll try. But I do understand if you want to take a break at some point. Um, the book itself has chapters, of course. And I don't love that the chapters aren't numbered, but I do love that they are all introduced by quotes from Princess Irulan's documentation on Paul's life. It builds the world, as well as sympathy for Irulan, who isn't even an active character. And, um, yeah, I mentioned the making of this video to my brother over Christmas. He said that he's listening to them right now because he's driving a lot. And he mentioned to me that people are talking about 
the white savior aspect and that's definitely here undeniably but i also feel that it's baked into the plot if not for the extremely long-term scheming of the Bene Gesserit, Paul and Jeskia couldn't have stepped into their leadership roles. So it's explained, as opposed to the case of, for instance, Avatar comes to mind, but I'm sure there are other examples that are equally applicable. Um, it's very easy for me to imagine what would be an, a different book entirely, where Paul and Jessica are roped into being powerless figureheads for a, a from an agenda. But that's not the case in this one, because the Bene Gesserit are thorough witches indeed. And um, it feels to me that the whole situation is created by the Emperor, the Empire, uh, as well as the Harkonnen's tyranny. They have brought the Fremen to a flashpoint and Paul just happens to be there. And it's not like the Fremen needs to be saved from themselves either. They would conquer the universe, they're fine. But I also understand that I'm not the most knowledgeable on this topic. But and I'm confident that more knowledgeable people than I have already made extensive commentary on that aspect. And the reason that I haven't gone looking for that in an article or something is for the same reason that I have spent minimal time on the Dune wiki. It's because I want to see what I get from the text. But it's here. It's sort of on the same level of discomfort as knowing that the Bene Gesserit, a core of extremely powerful women, are waiting for a man to be born to lead them. It's slightly uncomfortable. But it doesn't feel like an anti-feminist statement, so I accept the premise, it's fine. Disbelief is suspended, and maybe there is some scientific reason for it. Like, maybe because biological men have both X and Y chromosomes. Or something, I don't know, I'm not a scientist. But that's also sort of one thing you want in a good sci-fi, is to feel, to trust the author enough to believe that there might be some science behind the fiction. And that's the case with this book. And I mean, whenever I make a stab at sci-fi, I do feel that it's a noticeable quality issue that I just make things up as I go along. It's one of the reasons that I don't write much science fiction. So, but it's there hanging out with the white savior vibes. Um, the patriarchy is not a topic of this video, but it is alive and well in this vision of mankind's distant future. And I, yeah, I think that's enough of this meandering introduction. So without further ado, let's get started. Book one, Dune, chapter one. I have numbered the chapters for my convenience in writing this script. Um, the book begins with Paul's encounter with the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother, Gaius Helen Mohayim, to evaluate his abilities, whether he clears the Bene Gesserit benchmark for human by tolerating pain, and if he might be the Kwisatz Hadrach, the epitome of their genetic breeding program, a man who can go with his inward eye where women cannot. The Bene Gesserit seemed to me to be based on a mix of science, mind over matter, and magic. I love them. They are definitely among the top magic orders out there. Oh, and I didn't, I didn't buy the ebook just to get nice looking quotes. Let's pretend that it's intentional so we can appreciate them in isolation. In the week before their departure to Arrakis, when all the final scurrying about had reached a nearly unbearable frenzy, an old crone came to visit the mother of the boy, Paul. It's a very nice setting of the activity, denoting this move as the consequential premise for the whole thing. It was a warm night at Castle Caladan, and the ancient pile of stone that had served the Atreides family as home for 26 generations bore that cold sweat feeling it acquired before a change in the weather. The nice disregardful description of a castle and nice use of cooled sweat feeling, very evocative. 
By the half-light of a suspenser lamp, dimmed and hanging near the floor, the awakened boy could see a bulky female shape at his door, standing one step ahead of his mother. It's a nice setting of the sci-fi feeling with suspenser lamp. The old woman was a witch shadow, hair like matted spiderwebs, hooded round darkness of features, eyes like glittering jewels. The Reverend Mother is very different from the miniseries, just saying, but I do love the description, matted spiderwebs particularly. Her voice wheezed and twanged like an untuned ballet set. It's very descriptive and um, an early introduction of this very story-significant sci-fi instrument. To fear, Hawat, his father's master of assassins, had explained it. Their mortal enemies, the Harkonnens, had been on Arrakis 80 years, holding the planet in quasi-fief under a Shom company contract to mine the geriatric spice Melange. I like the clear summary, and it also shows that Herbert not only makes up his own words, he often uses real words slightly differently, as is very believable with how language evolves. According to Marian Webster, geriatric broadly means to do with old age, but it's used here as though it means a quality of extending life. Now the Harkonnen were leaving to be replaced by the House Atreides in Fief Complete, an apparent victory for, for Duke Leto. Yet, Hawat had said, this appearance contained the deadliest peril, for the Duke Leto was popular among the great houses of the Landsrad. Politics? Wonderful. This world of Castle Caladan, without clay or companion his own age, perhaps did not deserve sadness in farewell. It's a very nice, concise summary of Paul's childhood. Dr. Yue, his teacher, had hinted that the Falfreluch's class system was not rigidly guarded on Arrakis. The planet sheltered people who lived at the desert edge without Cade or Bashar to command them. Will of the Sand people called Fremen marked down on no senses of the Imperial Brigade. Nice twist on Will of the Wisp. And according to Marion Webster, Cade has three meanings. One, Al Cade, a commander of a castle or forest, as among Spaniards, Portuguese, or Moors. To A, a Muslim local administrator, judge, and tax collector in Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. Or to B, a chief, especially of the Berber tribal communities of the Atlas region. And Bashar isn't a word. But you get an idea thanks to the pairing. And you would understand this without looking it up, but I do love me my dictionary. She was feeling her age this morning, more than a little petulant. She blamed it on space travel and association with that abominable spacing guild and its secretive ways. So the Bene Gesserit don't get along with the spacing guild, that's nice to know. And the Reverend Mother is really not the one to complain about anyone else's secretive ways. And this is page 8, and I'm already very, very well into how information is delivered. You sense complicated world building without it being shoved at you in exposition. I did have the benefit of knowing a lot of the basics already, obviously, but I do appreciate the pacing. But here was a mission that required personal attention from a Bene Gesserit with the sight. Even the Padishah Emperor's truth sayer couldn't evade that responsibility when the duty came. This says a lot about the state of things, the importance of the Bene Gesserit and the Emperor. And Padishah has a Persian origin, meaning one, a chief, chief ruler, sovereign, especially the Shah of Iran, or two, a powerful, important personage, mogul. The old woman studied Paul in one gestalt and flicker. Face oval like Jessica's, but strong bones. Hair, the Duke's black black, but with a brow line of the maternal grandfather who cannot be named, and that thin, disdainful nose, shape of directly staring green eyes, like the old Duke, the paternal grandfather who is dead. Nice player description of Paul, and interesting use of Gestalten. And why can't the maternal grandfather be named? Hmm. Leave us. I enjoin you to practice the meditation of peace. Nice use of enjoying. Politeness and his mother's obvious awe of this old woman argued caution. Nice use of argued. She whirled and strode from the room in a dry swishing of skirt. Nice use of dry swishing. 
You might notice that Herbert has a habit of using the ing suffix on nouns, such as swishing when swish would suffice. Sometimes this approved of by word and by Marion Webster in the plural. I actually have no preference in this case. I wouldn't use the ing when it's not necessary, but it's fine. He looked up into bird bright eyes. Another nice description of the Reverend Mother. He swung his attention back to her face. Nice use of swung with the abstract attention. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear have gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Of course, I had to include the Bene Gesserit litany against fear. His world emptied of everything except that hand immersed in agony. The ancient face inches away staring at him. Lovely. He thought he could feel the skin curling black on that agonized hand, the flesh crisping and dropping away until only charred bones remained. Fantastic. Enough, the old woman muttered. Kal Wahad. No woman child ever withstood that much. I must have wanted you to fail. It is a hint unnecessary to emphasize it, isn't it? Oh well. Memory of pain inhibited every movement. Reason told him he would withdraw a blackened stump from that box. Nice, strong imagery here. The tangential slash of her question shocked his mind into a higher awareness, sans through a screen. He nodded. Nice use of tangential slash. I observed you in pain. Pain's merely the axis of the test. Sounds great, even though it's also a hint too advanced for me to fully understand. She extinguished the excitement, reminding herself. Cool, clouds observation. Even the Reverend Mother has a mild inclination to believe that Paul is the special someone chosen by fate. And a lot of genetic breeding programs. The harmonics of ability confirmed by repeated tests were in his voice. No, I don't really understand this either, but I still appreciate it. He wanted to get away alone and think this experience through, but knew he could not leave until he was dismissed. The old woman had gained a power over him, which is a nice setup for a later resolution. They spoke truth. His mother had undergone this test. There must be terrible purpose in it. The pain and fear had been terrible. He understood terrible purposes. They drove against all odds. They were their own necessity. Paul felt that he had been infected with terrible purpose. He did not know yet what the terrible purpose was. Which is a surprisingly nice paragraph, considering all of the iteration. The sound of her voice had contained a difference, then, from any other voice in his experience. The words were outlined in brilliance. There was an edge to them. He felt that any question he might ask her would bring an answer that could lift him out of his flesh world into something greater. Nice use of flesh world. And it's an interesting way to concretize this important and if abstract power of the voice by the Reverend Mother's mastery of it. Right out of the Butlerian Jihad and the Orange Catholic Bible, she said. And that's quite the sentence, isn't it? It signals to me that insofar as this book is concerned, one religion is very much like another. Also, it's probably good that I did this video now, when, when monetization isn't even a glimmer on the horizon. I wonder if the word jihad is as prominent in other books? Maybe you can help me think of a clever word to replace it with in future videos. Comment down below. But what the OC Bible should have said is, Thou shalt not make a machine to counterfeit a human mind. Have you studied the Mentat in your service? First, I keep feeling that there is an Orange County joke here, which I don't have. My one reference for the Orange County is that teenage drama, The O.C., and while I remember being quite excited to see it when it aired, I don't remember anything from it. I don't remember a plot point or an actor or character. So I'm sorry, you'll have to insert your own O.C. Bible joke here. Is it just me or 
Was the OC a highly forgettable show? Comment that down below. <laughs> Second, I do wonder if they make a bigger deal out of the ban on AI in the major, in the major motion picture since it's such a hot topic. We learn here that moving away from reliance on AI is the founding reason for the Bene Gesserit order as well as the Spacing Guild, the guild I feel to replace computing power, and the Bene Gesserit to curate the ultimate potential in human beings that were being hampered by computers. Then there are Mentats, who are like human, supercompu human supercomputers. You feed them information which they use to compute likelihoods. The old woman's words abruptly lost their special sharpness for Paul. He felt an offense against what his mother called his instinct for rightness. It wasn't that the Reverend Mother had lied to him. She obviously believed what she said. It was something deeper, something tied to his terrible purpose. Paul is feeling there is something wrong with the Bene Gesserit breeding program which somehow doesn't become an issue with Jessica's long-term belief in it. It is interesting that Paul is shown in, in opposition to the Bene Gesserit so early in the book. Yet, there is a place where no true sayer can see. We are repelled by it, terrorized. It is said a man will come one day and find in the gift of the drug his inward eye. He will look where we cannot, into both feminine and masculine pasts. It is interesting that looking into the past is held as the essential thing to prevent human stagnation. And I suppose I understand that part. Chapter 2 Wherein we learn that the Harkonnen are evil, the Baron Vladimir most of all, and there is, there is a traitor in place within House Atreides. The Baron has received a letter from Duke Leto, declining an invitation for a meeting. We learn the details of the plot to kill Leto, and that it has imperial backing, which is to be kept secret. The Emperor has failed to establish control on Dune, and thus rely on his connections within the illegal trade. The evil Mentat, employed by the Baron, Piter, has been promised Jessica as a reward for his part in devising the plan. It was a relief globe of a world, partly in shadows, spinning under the impetus of a fat hand that glittered with rings. A cool gadget, along with a telling introduction of the antagonist. I guess he's the antagonist. There are a few candidates for the position. An ellipsoid desk with a top of jade pink petrified alaka wood stood at the center of the room. Very formed suspensor chairs ringed it, two of them occupied. And here is something about sci-fi and fantasy, describing things with words without any reference. I have no you way to picture a lack of wood. I don't know whether it's always pink and petrified, but I appreciate that this doesn't happen too often in this book. And I do uh, really appreciate the use of ellipsoid desk, though very form doesn't seem to be a standard English word. It's not in Merriam-Webster, and Google shows results for other words when I search it. A chuckle sounded beside the globe. The basso voice rumbled out of the chuckle. There it is, Piter, the biggest man-trap in all history. Nice description of Arrakis, and I do like the Italian-sounding descriptors for sounds that Herbert uses. It's also a nice use of rumble out of the chuckle. Be silent, Piter, the Baron said, and the laughter stopped as though shut off with a switch. Kindly, is it? the Baron asked. Vendetta, hey? And he uses the nice old word so rich in tradition to be sure I know he means it. I did some searches on the wiki, and Kindly is an in-universe word for a sanctioned blood feud between noble families, in a ritualized manner to minimize the number of casualties. Most of the terms Herber invents are fantastic, because they describe societal occurrences rather than desks. The Baron stared across the room at his Mentas assassin, seeing the feature about him that most noted first. The shaded slits of blue within blue, the eyes without any white in them at all. This description of an evil character makes you wonder whether the description is intrinsic to the evil. A grin flashed across Piter's face. It was like a mask grimace beneath those eyes like holes. Nice imagery of a theater, Matt. 
masks, making me feel smart when the imagery is obviously the intention. His face threw down into the caricature of a frowning mask. Confirmed. The Duke must know when I encompass his doom, the Baron said. Wonderful villain theatrics here. He straightened, assuming an odd attitude of dignity, as though it were another mask, but this time clothing his entire body. I think Piter wasn't done justice in the miniseries because I don't remember such a character at all. But Hawat had investigated and found that our doctor is a SOC school graduate with imperial conditioning, supposedly safe enough to minister even to the emperor. Great story set on imperial conditioning. It's assumed that ultimate conditioning cannot be removed without killing the subject. Which says plenty about a society when someone cannot be fully trusted without psychological restraints on betrayal. However, as someone once observed, given the right lever, you can move a planet. I'm really interested in the clues about Earth and ancestry. I don't think it's supposed to be a mystery that these humans were originated from Earth. Just look at their names. But it is fairly subtle most of the time. Sardukar, Fade Ravsa breathed. His mind focused on the dread imperial troops, the killers without mercy, the soldier fanatics of the Padisha Emperor. Cool. Fade Rautha nodded. Wealth was the thing. Shown was the key to wealth. Each noble house dipping from the company's coffers, whatever it could under the power of the directorships. Those shown directorships. They were the real evidence of political power in the Imperium, passing with the shifts of voting strength within the Landsrad as it balanced itself against the Emperor and his supporters. Throughout my first read of this, I for some reason consistently read directorships as di dictatorships and thought it was really cool. And then I realized that I seem to have very localized dyslexia at times. Indeed, the Baron said, and he thought, it's only just. We're the ones who tamed Arrakis, except for the few mongrel Fremen hiding in the skirts of the desert, and some tame smugglers bound to the planet almost as tightly as a native labor pool. Yeah, he's just terrible throughout. The Baron moved out and away from the globe of Arrakis. As he emerged from the shadows, his figure took on dimension. Grossly and immensely fat, and with subtle bulges beneath folds of his dark robes to reveal that all this fat was sustained partly by portable suspensors harnessed to his flesh. The indulgence of the rich cannot be more viscerally portrayed. Wealth is the Harkonnen's foremost advantage. I love the Baron in the miniseries, and there he is actually flying around most rooms he's in using those suspensors. It, that's not here, but it's the visual sticks with me. Chapter 3 In which we learn more about Jessica and the Reverend Mother. That Jessica was supposed to have daughters for the Bene Gesserit breeding program, as well as one of them being married to the Ar Harkonnen heir to end the feud. Jessica chose to have a son to provide Leda with one, and she somewhat privately hopes that Paul is the superhuman man the Bene Gesserit are after. And the Reverend Mother, Gaius Helen, is also somewhat endeared to us by some apparent affection for Jessica. But she has also written off Paul's father, so she's not, not too sympathetic. She obviously knows that the Emperor is going to betray him, but here it seems that she knows because she can predict the future. The voice carried a tone of cruel mimicry. Nice use of cruel mimicry. So I had a son, Jessica flared, and she knew she was being goaded into this anger deliberately. Nice use of flared. I see in the future what I've seen in the past. You well know the pattern of our affairs, Jessica. The race knows its own mortality and fear stagnation of its heredity. It's in the bloodstream, the urge to mingle genetic strains without plan. The Imperium, the Shome Company, all the great houses, they are but bits of flotsam in the path of the flood. It's nice to see their justification for their breeding program. The Emperor and his friends now command 59.65% of the Shome directorship votes. 
It is a fascinating mix between feudalism and capitalism in this, these politics, and it's nicely complicated to try to figure out which one is more powerful. We're a three-point civilization, the imperial household balanced against the federated great houses of the Landsrad, and between them, the guild with its damnable monopoly on interstellar transport. There really is nothing but hatred for the guild from start to finish here. Paul stared at her. She said purpose, and he felt the word buffet him, reinfecting him with terrible purpose. He experienced a sudden anger at her. Fatia's old witch with her mouth full of platitudes. Understandable. And fatuous is a great word, don't you think? Chapter 4 one week later, and Paul has inter has interactions with the Fur Hawat, the Mentat, and has a mock fight with Gurney Halleck. While it's tragic that Gurney seems to be Paul's only semblance of a friend, there also seems to be genuine affection within the Atreides camp. He stood there a moment, feeling old and tired and storm-leathered. Nice use of storm-leathered. It struck him as an odd place suddenly, a stranger place, with most of its hardware already gone off to Arrakis. Nice use of stranger place. And I like the clarification that they really are stripping their old home to take along to Arrakis. There's little to tell them from the folk of the Graben and Sink. New word for me, Graben. Which means a depressed segment of the Earth's crust, bounded on at least two sides by faults, and generally of considerable length as compared with its width. Compare Horst. Her words were only now beginning to come into full register. Nice use of full register. She said a ruler must learn to persuade and not to compel. She said he must lay the best coffee hearth to attract the finest men. It's interesting use of coffee hearth to describe a new societal structure. The coffee service is significant also to the Fremen as, a symbol as symbolic of a household. The ink vine scar along his jawline writhed as he turned, casting a smile across the room. As far as I can tell, ink vine is not a thing in English, but it is very evocative. But later it seems it's not descriptive of the scar but denotes the kind of whip used to make it by the Harkonnen Rabban. So it's sass for our elders today, Halleck said. He tried a chord on the instrument, nodded. Like musicians be doing. He grabbed up a rapier, laced the air with it. Needless use of up, but cool description on sword action. Paul snapped the force button at his waist, felt the crinkled skin tingling of the defensive field at his forehead and down his back, heard external sounds take on characteristic shield-filtered flatness. One of the things that keeps me away from sci-fi is descriptions of technology, but these are so good. They make sense, they have character, and they have limitations. In shield fighting, one moves fast on defense, slow on attack, Paul said. Attack has the sole purpose of tricking the opponent into a misstep, setting him up for the attack sinister. The shield turns the fast blows, admits the slow kinjal. Nice use of attack sinister. A kinjal is apparently a dagger, apparently used together with a sword. He felt the field crackling as shield edges touched and repelled each other, sensed the electric tingling of the contact along his skin. Cool. There was pain in him, like a blister. All that was left of some yesterday, time had pruned off him. Nice use of pruned. Paul countered a slow swing of the dummy, brought up his left hand entre tisseur. I butchered that. But nice touch, putting fencing terms in French. Which here means interweaving. Chapter 5 Dr. Yue gives Paul a miniature copy of the Orange Catholic Bible to ease his conscience for the upcoming betrayal. We learn that the Harkonnen has his wife as a hostage, who is or isn't still being tortured by them. We already know through Gurney that they are evil to their prisoners. We learn that the Fremen is one distinct group of people choosing to live close to the desert rather than in the cities. Although he heard Dr. Yue enter the training room, noting the stiff deliberation of the man's pace, 
Paul remained stretched out face down on the exercise table where the masseuse had left him. Yeah, he's a nobleman, so he gets ma a massage after training. <laughs> Paul raised his head, saw the man's stick figure standing several paces away, took in at a glance the wrinkled black clothing, the square block of a head with purple lips and drooping mustache, the diamond tattoo of imperial conditioning on his forehead, the long black hair caught in the Sook School's silver ring at the left shoulder. Excellent description in general. Never touch the actual pages with your fingers. The filament tissue is too delicate. Cool technology and cool extension of the telltale thin pages of the Bible. UA watched Paul work the page adjustment, thought, I salved my own conscience. I gave him the surcease of religion before betraying him. Thus may I say to myself that he has gone where I cannot go. It's really interesting to see into UA's motivations, while in the miniseries they extend the mystery of the identity of the traitor. I'm also really appreciative of Herbert's way of switching the point of view between characters in the same scene. It could easily feel jerky, but it always fits really well. Also, nice use of Cersei's. Paul looked down at the tiny book in his palm, such a small thing, yet it contained a mystery. Something had happened while he read from it. He had felt something stir his terrible purpose. I'm guessing it's because it's a window into the past, but I'm not sure. Quoting from it later does earn him points here and there. Chapter 6 We see Paul interact with Leto the first time. Paul discovers that the Reverend Mother put some psychological restraint on him, making him unable to recount what happened with her. They discuss what the upcoming change will mean for House Atreides. The fact that the Harkonnen have stockpiled spice will makes it look like they intend for Leto to fail in his production, upsetting everyone who suffers a lack of spice and profit. Notably, Leto sees a threat in the Emperor and he believes that the elite Imperial troops actually come from the Emperor's prison planet, Seleucus Secundus. It's speculative, but it leads the Duke to see the same potential in the Fremen justifying walking into the expected trap on Arrakis. Also, unbeknownst to him, Paul has received Mentat training his whole life. As always, Paul experienced a sense of presence in his father, someone totally here. We know by now that the Duke is going to die, and all the scenes with him are kind of tragic, especially seeing how Paul admires and benefits from his father. He felt tired, filled with the ache of not showing his fatigue. Oh, the burden of leadership and fatherhood. The Duke forced himself to the casual gesture, sat down on a corner of the table, smiled. I'm really getting into the pared down language Herbert is using. He definitely has a style. A whole pattern of conversation welled up in his mind, the kind of thing he might use to dispel the vapors in his men before a battle. The pattern froze before it could be vocalized, confronted by the single thought, This is my son. Tragic. I also see the Combine Honit Ober Advancer Mercantiles, the Shom Company. Learning the full thing has not elucidated me to what it means, but they control the spies and gaining some shares in the company helps their tradies, being at a financial disadvantage against the Harkonnen, who are extremely wealthy. Few products escape the shome touch, the duke said. Logs, donkeys, horses, cows, lumber, dung, sharks, whale fur, the most prosaic and the most exotic, even our poor pandi rice from Caladan. Anything the guild will transport, the art forms of Icas, the machines of Richesse and Ix, but all fades before the melange. A handful of spice will buy a home on Dupile. It cannot be manufactured, it must be mined on Arrakis. It is unique and has true geriatric properties. Here, the names of things expand the universe and is nice with a practical description of the importance of Shome, the Spacing Guild, and Spice. And who would have thought? The future has farewell, you guys. That's wonderful. But the important thing is to consider all the houses that depend on Shaum profits and think of the enormous proportion of those profits dependent upon a single product, the spice. The value of diversifying your portfolio has obviously been lost. 
the duke permitted himself a moment of grim satisfaction looking at his son and thinking how penetrating how truly educated that observation had been i get the feeling that paul is a lot less callow in this phase than what i picture from the miniseries after all one's own profits come first the great convention be damned you can't let someone pauperize you capitalism heck yeah also nice use of pauperize there are proven ways play on the certain knowledge of their superiority the mystique of secret covenant the esprit of shared suffering it can be done it has been done on many worlds in many times they're talking about the sardaukar so it feels very fitting to think about the term esprit de corps in the esprit of shared suffering not even their agents ever see a guildsman the guilds as jealous of its privacy as it is of its monopoly don't do anything to endanger our shipping privileges paul paul is curious about the special guild members called navigators who navigate faster than light travel i am somewhat confused about the secrecy here because the miniseries shows a navigator a very alien looking thing in transit to arrakis but i thought menta training had to start during infancy and the subject couldn't be told because it might inhibit the early he broke off all his past circumstances coming to focus in one flashing computation i see he said i appreciate that the basis of paul's superpowers are established so early that it's clear that he has been trained into them his whole life there are reasons for his military genius so he has been unknowingly trained to be the best duke ever. Formidable indeed, the duke murmured, and Paul saw the proud smile on his father's face. The smile shocked Paul. It had a skull look on the duke's narrow features. Paul closed his eyes, feeling that the terrible purpose reawakened within him. Perhaps being a mentat is terrible purpose, he thought. But even as he focused on this thought, his new awareness denied it. To be fair being a mentat doesn't seem to be all that nice chapter seven the family has arrived on arrakis jessica has an exchange with leto which is a hint questionable but it overall seems to show that, that they care for each other jessica uses her intuition and bene Gesser training to trick the fremen housekeeper mapes that she is a person foretold to be the mother of a savior figure in fremen legend with the Lady Jessica and Arrakis, the Bene Gesserit system of sowing implant legend through the Missionaria Protectiva comes to its full fruition. The wisdom of seeding the known universe with a prophecy pattern for the protection of BG personnel has long been appreciated, but never have we seen a condition at extremis with more ideal mating of person and preparation. And this is part of why the Bene Gesserit are so cool as a magical order the long-term planning is insane all around the lady jessica piled in corners of the arakeen great hall mounded in the open spaces stood the package fright of their lives boxes trunks cartons cases some partly packed the words great hall is later on capitalized but not here hmm she moved in a slow turn, looking up and around at shadowed carvings, crannies in deeply recessed windows. This giant anachronism of a room reminded her of the sisters' hall at her Bene Gesserit school, but at the school the effect had been warmth. Here all was bleak stone. Nice way to show that Jessica has fond memories of her childhood. Some architect had reached far back into history for these buttressed walls and dark hangings, she thought. I choose to read this as commentary how this this society has shown signs of regression. This had been the government mansion in the days of the old empire. Costs had been of less importance then. It had been before the Harkonnens and their new megalopolis of Carthag, a sheep and brassy place some 200 kilometers northeast across the broken land. I was surprised that megalopolis is a real word but it is and it's great i love it i'm gonna try to use it she looked at his tallness at the dark skin that made her think of olive groves and golden sun on blue waters there was wood smoke in the gray of his eyes but the face was predatory thin full of sharp angles and planes 
the nice, detailed description of Leto. A sudden fear of him tightened her breast. He had become such a savage, driving person since the decision to bow to the Emperor's command. And yes, it is worrisome that she is ever fearful of her partner, no matter how stressed out he gets. It was a woman's voice, thin and stringy. Nice use of stringy. So nice, actually, that I almost used it in one of my own stories today, but I restrained myself. Jessica whirled, stared down at the knobby, grey-haired woman in a shapeless sack of Bondsman Brown, an appropriately condescending description, and Bondsman Brown is a great pairing. And Jessica wondered, why do I play out this sham? But the Bene Gesserit ways were devious and compelling. So this is like Jessica has no choice but to follow her schooling, which sets a tone. She read the more obvious signs in mates at actions and appearance, the petite betrayals. Nice use of petite betrayals. Aye, mates wailed. It was a sound of both grief and elation. She trembled so hard the knife blade sent glittering shards of reflection shooting around the room. I know my voice acting really sold that wonderful line. Jessica waited, poised. She had intended to say the knife was a maker of death and then add the ancient word, but every sense warned her now, all the deep training of alertness that exposed meaning in the most casual muscle twitch. Nice er, is a nice early example of Jessica's intuition enhanced by her training. Ah no, the body's water is scant enough without gushing a wasteful lot of it into the air. Nice abbreviation of without. Jessica felt the cold sheath of the curse knife beneath her bodice, thought of the long chain of Bene Gesserit scheming that had forged another link here. Because of that scheming, she had survived a deadly crisis. Bene Gesserit for the win. And not all the preparations of the Missionaria Protectiva, nor ha Hawat's suspicious inspection of this castellated pile of rocks could dispel the feeling. Nice use of castellated, and I don't think Herbert likes castles very much. Chapter 8 in which we get further insight into UA's situation in a conversation with Jessica, and it provides a sharp contrast to how the Harkonnen have a hostile internal state, while in Atreides there is love and affection. UA's plan is to try to kill the Baron when he is in proximity. He looked from behind like a fleshless stick figure in over-large black clothing, a caricature poised for stringy movement at the direction of a puppet master really nice description and is this jessica's intuition trying to warn her the laugh broke through her restraints emerging brittle without humor and jessica has significant restraints yet that thought carried its own rigors hardening him to his purpose nice use of rigors and hardening slatted blinds at a window beside the bed wove a loom of shadows across face and blanket lovely for the first time, he was caught up in the thought that he might be part of a pattern more involuted and complicated than his mind could grasp. That's an elitist scientist for you. It doesn't dissuade him from his plan. She glanced out to the right at a slope humped with wind-troubled grey-green of bushes, dusty leaves and dry claw branches. The too dark sky hung over the slope like a blot, and the milky light of the arakeen sun gave the scene a silver cast lithe like the crisp knife concealed in her bodice nice use of wind troubled in general a great description everywhere you turn here you're involved with a lack of water nice use of involved and the water thing is consistent through the whole book those animals his wife was bene Gesserit. the signs are all over him and it's obvious the harkonnens killed her here's another poor victim bound to the atreides by a harem of hate while Harem seems pretty clear here, I had to take to the internet, and Wikipedia has this definition of the Hebrew word. I'm guessing another evolved word in this case. It has been, dis it has been defined as a mode of secluding and rendering harmless anything imperiling the religious life of a nation or the total destruction of the enemy and his goods at the conclusion of a campaign or uncompromising consecration of property and dedication to god without possibility of recall or redemption 
It is translated into Latin as devotion, a word used for human sacrifice, and into Greek as anathema, which was a sacrifice to the gods and later to God. The baron cannot forget that Leto is a cousin of the royal blood, no matter what the distance. While the Harkonnen titles came out of the Shom pocketbook, but the poison in him, deep in his mind, is a knowledge that an Atreides had a Harkonnen banished for cowardice after the Battle of Corin. It's nice to see uh, displayed that feudalism has a thumb edge against capitalism and profit. The irony was that such deadlines should come to flower here on Arrakis, the one source in the universe of melange, the prolonger of life, the giver of health. If you haven't caught it yet, spice is important. Besides Wellington, the Duke is really two men. One of them I love very much. He's charming, witty, considerate, tender, everything a woman could desire. But the other man is cold, callous, demanding, selfish, as harsh and cruel as winter wind. That's the man shaped by the father. Which is quite worrisome and continues to become more so. In the silence that came between them, a breeze from a ventilator could be heard fingering the blinds. Nice use of fingering. Stay tuned for the fun number. Chapter 9, in which Paul is nearly assassinated and then saves the life of Mapes. In return, she tells him that there is a traitor among them. Names and pictures, names and pictures from man's tyrannic past, and many to be found now nowhere else in the universe except here on Arrakis. Which is some kind of ironic, I just don't know how. From behind the headboard slipped a tiny hunter-seeker no more than five centimeters long. Paul recognized it at once, a common assassination weapon that every child of royal blood learned about at an early age. It was a ravening sliver of metal guided by some nearby hand and eye. Nice use of ravening, and also interesting that nobility is said to have royal blood. The hunter-seeker arrowed past his head toward the motion. Nice use of arrowed. So that was a Fremen. He paused for the mnemonic blink that would store the pattern of her face in his memory. Prune wrinkled features, darkly browned, blue on blue eyes, without any white in them. He attached the label, the shout out mates. It's a very cool description of something that never happens again. Chapter 10 Jessica discovers a very costly maintained greenhouse, and in it a hidden message from the Bene Gesserit wife of the previous temporary ruler, Count Fenring. It repeats that there is a traitor. Jessica also has a flash of jealousy that Count Fenring married his Bene Gesserit partner while she is only a concubine, so that Leto still has the opportunity for a politically advantageous marriage. Long shadows stab down the hall. She returned her attention to the stairs. Harsh side lighting picked out bits of dried earth on the open metalwork of the steps. Nice details. Beyond the ducal grounds stretched a high fenced storage yard lines of spice silos in it with stilt-legged watchtowers standing around it like so many startled spiders. She could see at least 20 storage yards of silos reaching out the cliffs of the shield wall. Silos repeated, stuttering across the basin. Nice use of stilt-legged and stuttering. Other lights had come on down the plain beneath the cliffs. Little yellows spaced out against blue darkness and one light off to the left grew brighter, began to wink back at the cliff, very fast. Blink squirt, glimmer, blink. Nice use of blink squirt. I don't think I'll ever find a use for that particular word, but it is still nice. Chapter 11. The Duke is very upset at the attempt at Paul's life, which is very nicely conveyed by the repeated line throughout the chapter, they have tried to take the life of my son. He relies heavily on Gurney to motivate leaving workers to stay behind, and on Hawat to make the city safe from whatever the Harkonnen left behind. The ritualistic formality of it touched him with a feeling of loneliness. Nice use of ritualistic formality. If the people of this decadent garrison city could only see the emperor's private note to his noble duke, the disdainful allusions to veiled men and women, 
But what else is one to expect of barbarians whose dearest dream is to live outside the ordered security of the Faufreluches? Oh, the elitism! And Faufreluches is a Herbert term that describes the class system, which doesn't seem all that secure to me. The central wastelands beyond those moon-frosted cliffs were desert, barren rock, dunes, and blowing dust, an uncharted dry wilderness with here and there along its rim, and perhaps scattered through it, not so fremen. Nice use of moon-frosted. The men were already boiling in from the field when he reached the yellow-domed room. They carried their space bags over their shoulders, shouting and roistering like students returning from vacation. So boarding schools are still a common thing, I guess? But I don't know why Leto would, ha would have this reference at the ready. Paul never had any friends growing up. Was Leto's youth that much different from his? His whole air was of casual, shoulder-set capability. Nice use of shoulder-set capability. He recognized a propaganda corpsman, stopped to give him a message that could be relayed to the men through channels. Those who had brought their women would want to know the women were safe and where they could be found. It is so nice that propaganda corpsman is an official position. Why pretend with calling it something else? Chapter 12, in which there is a strategy meeting with the house leadership. Hawat is immensely contrite for not having prevented the would-be assassination, but Leto is a just leader, seeing that Hawat's regret is punishment enough. There are many more Fremen on Arrakis than previously anticipated, and they are led by someone named Liet. We learn how spice is mined, that shields are dangerous on Arrakis because they attract sandworms. Leto knows, somehow, that the plan is to ship in Sardukard, disguised as Harkonnen troops. He means to counter it with recruitment of the Fremen. Duncan Idaho, the weapons master, is stationed with the Fremen permanently, sort of, as he has been temporarily so far, and we first meet Stilgar, a leader among the Fremen. They don't know yet who's going to win this exchange, the Duke said. Most of the houses have grown fat by taking few risks. One cannot truly blame them for this, one can only despise them. This part used to have a typo, but I still appreciate the humor. Paul held himself apart from the humor. His attention focused on the projection and the question that filled his mind. Paul continues to reveal himself as mature despite being only 15 years old. Paul looked at his father, back to Hawat, suddenly conscious of the Mentat's great age, aware that the old man had served three generations of Atreides. Aged. It showed in the roomy shine of the brown eyes, in the cheeks cracked and burned by exotic weathers, in the rounded curve of the shoulders, and the thin set of his lips with a cranberry-colored stain of sappho use. Another great description. These hearkening creatures you eliminated, the duke said. Were they propertied? Nice use of propertied, new to me. He knew the actual no-holds-barred convention that ruled in Candley, but this was the sort of move that could destroy them even as it gave them victory. It's nice to learn more about Candley, but here it seems to go against the wiki's emphasis that it was meant to be between individuals rather than soldiers. I have been a stranger in a strange land, Halleck quoted. Apparently, this is from the King James Bible. I'm not an expert, but I'm liking the traces of religion. One moment, please, Leto said, and the very mildness of his voice held them. Nice description of inveterate leadership. It's said among the Fremen that there were more than 200 of these advanced bases built here in Arrakis during the Desert Botanical Testing Station period. This was apparently before the spice was discovered, and I do wonder what surplus of wealth motivated the colonization of such a hostile environment. What botanical value was there? It ended up in confusion, Paul thought, staring at the backs of the last men to leave. Always before, staff had ended on an incisive air. This meeting had just seemed to trickle out, worn down by its own inadequacies, and with an argument to top it off. Nicely ominous for the build-up. Chapter 13 In a private conversation with Hawat, the Duke instructs him to raid the Harkonnen's secret stash of spies. 
and informs him of the new reports of a potential traitor among them. As the Harkonnen intended, Hawat believes that the traitor is Jessica. Leto doesn't accept it, but allows for Hawat's precautions. The Duke learns of the Fremen prophecy that Paul might be a character that they call Mahdi. The Harkonnens mean to destroy you, my lord. Their intent is not just to kill. There's a range of fine distinctions in Kanli. This could be a work of art among vendettas. And all this because a Harkonnen was shamed by an Atreides however long ago? A pre-dawn hush had come over the desert basin. Nice use of pre-dawn hush. There came the long, bell-tolling movement of dawn, striking across a broken horizon. Nice use of bell-tolling movement. Chapter 14 Ledo informs Paul about the Fremen hopes for a messiah. He also tells Paul to join in a pretense that he mistrusts Jessica, which is shitty and uh, ultimately foreshadowing. He also allows Paul to see how lowly he values their chances on Arrakis, which is very human of him. The memories touched his feelings of terrible purpose, shading this strange world with sensations of familiarity that he could not understand. Nice use of shading. The white sun was well into its morning quadrant. Milky light picked at a boiling of dust clouds that spilled over into the blind canyons interfingering the shield wall. Nice use of interfingering. I hope to smoke at a traitor. It must seem I've been completely cozened. She must be hurt this way, that she does not suffer greater hurt. Nice use of cozened. But I still think it's unfair to involve Paul in the deception of Jessica. I am tired, the duke agreed. I am morally tired. The melancholy degeneration of the great houses has afflicted me at last, perhaps. And we were such a strong people once. Nice use of melancholy degeneration. Chapter 15 Paul and Leto go out with the planetologist Kynes to observe a spice factory and witness it being destroyed by a sandworm. Leto notably cares more about the potential death of the workers, and Kynes is impressed by Paul's remarkable suitability for the prophesied messiah. It's obvious that Kynes, though in the em employ of the emperor, is a leader to the Fremen and has gone native. There are also cool description of flying machines, which I don't fully appreciate. I'm sorry. His first encounter with the people he had been ordered to betray left Dr. Kynes shaken. He prided himself on being a scientist to whom legends were merely interesting clues pointing toward cultural roots. Yet the boy fitted the ancient prophecy so precisely. He had the questing eyes and the air of reserved candor. Nice introduction to the conflict within Kynes. Behind them came a tall man, hawk-faced, dark of skin and hair. He wore a yuba cloak with a trade's crest at the breast and wore it in a way that betrayed his unfamiliarity with the garment. It clung to the legs of his still suit on one side. It lacked a free swinging striding rhythm. It's a nice way to use clothes to show the off-worldliness of the Atreides, which then contrasted with Paul's comfort with the clothing. And I really like the word still suit for the suit they wear to maintain moisture in the desert. You can easily imagine the evolution of it from the word distill. And juba is a new word for me. A long outer garment resembling an open coat, having long sleeves and worn especially formally in Muslim countries, especially by public officials and professional people. Thank you, Marion Webster. Kynes took a deep breath to still his resentment against Halleck, who had briefed him on how to behave with the duke and the ducal heir. And we see here that Kynes resents being informed on how to show deference because, as it turns out, he is a semi-god among the Fremen. <laughs> the thoughts flick through his mind with decision hard on their heels. It's a very nice formulation. The duke glanced down to the left at the broken landscape of the shield wall. Chasms of tortured rock, patches of yellow-brown crossed by black lines of fall chattering. It was as though someone had dropped this ground from space and left it where it smashed. Nice use of tortured rock and generally great description. The ornithopter swept over a bare rock plain. 
Hall looked down from their two thousand meters altitude, saw the wrinkled shadow of their craft and escort. The land beneath seemed flat, but shallow wrinkles said otherwise. Nice use of wrinkled shadows. Paul leaned back in his corner. His truth sense, awareness of tone shadings, told him that Kynes was lying and telling half-truths. And he thought, if there's a relationship between spice and worms, killing the worms would destroy the spice. It's nice, not so subtle foreshadowing. <laughs> I see two, three, four spotters, Kynes said. They're watching for worm sign. I had to include this because I have such a firm memory of my brother playing the game Dune 2000 and a female computer voice saying, Worm sign. Kynes frowned. The child kept asking adult questions. Perspicacious Paul strikes again. The others heard it then. An abrasive slithering, distant and growing louder. Nice use of abrasive slithering. Paul glanced at Halleck. He too had seen the tension wrinkles at the corner of his father's jaw. One walked softly when the duke was in a rage. Leto has good reason to be angry, but he shouldn't take that anger out on his subordinates. It makes the duke seem unfortunately abusive. Against his own will and all previous judgments, Kynes admitted to himself, I like this duke as one leader from another, I guess. Chapter 16, in which there is a dinner party full of intrigue. Letter forbids a demeaning water splashing custom, something that is transposed to Jessica in the miniseries. Kynes is further drawn in by Jessica's coherence with the legends, and it is shown that the Harkonnen have influential agents on Arrakis. Paul shows himself to be even more insightful Kynes is shown to have a great deal of influence and aligns himself with the Atreides. We learn that the Harkonnen are attempting to smuggle laser guns onto Arrakis. All of a pattern, he thought, you can plumb us by our language, the precise and delicate delineations for ways to administer treacherous death. Will someone trow Chamurki tonight, poison in the drink, or will it be Chaumas, poison in the food? So true and also great use of plum. Her leathery face displayed a twisting of emotions, dismay, anger. It's nice, but twisting when twist would do. And also, this edition has chosen to put a full stop after the ellipses at the end of a sentence, which feels unnecessary to me. Comment if you have an opinion. Memories rolled in his mind like the toothless mutterings of old women. I don't know what about it I like, but I do. He remembered open water and waves, days of grass instead of sand, dazed summers that had whipped past him like windstorm leaves. Nights use of dazed summers and windstorm leaves. Most of the women in the hall seemed cast from a specific type. Decorative, precisely turned out, an odd mingling of untouchable sensuousness Nice use of the contradictive, untouchable sensuousness. There was Paul in the corner, surrounded by a fawning group of the younger Arakane Riches, and aloof among them, three officers of the house troop. Riches is a very nice herbert term, I think, which is instantly recognizable. Seeing all the shattering faces, Paul was suddenly repelled by them. They were cheap masks locked on festering thoughts. Voices gabbling to drown out the loud silence in every breast. Oh, the vapid emptiness of wealth. Leto heard the sudden oily tone in the man's voice, noted the watchful silence in this group, the way heads were beginning to turn toward them around the room. Nice use of watchful silence. Leto's attention was caught by the expression on Kine's face. The man was staring at Jessica. He appeared transfigured, like a man in love or caught in a religious trance. Kynes, being a skeptical scientist, makes it even clearer how neatly Jessica and Paul fit into the religious expectations. The planetologist's odd question seemed to have gone unnoticed by the others, and now Kynes was bending over one of the concert women, listening to a low-voiced coquetry. Nice use of low-voiced coquetry. The thought fanned her secret hope for Paul. He could be the Kwisatz Hadrach. He could be. 
nice recalling of fanning a flame. The others settled with a swishing of fabrics, a scraping of chairs, but the Duke remained standing. Swishing, scraping. I know I've made my point, but still. Now, sitting at table with her son and her Duke and their guests, hearing that Guild Bank representative, Jessica felt a chill of realization. The man was a Harkonnen agent. He had the Giedi Prime speech pattern, subtly masked, but exposed to her trained awareness as though he had announced himself. The Bene Gesserit are really cool. Slowly, the dinner conversation resumed, but Jessica heard the agitation in it, the brittle quality, saw that the banker ate in sullen silence. Another nice description. Chuckles sounded at odd places around the table. Another one. She addressed herself to the still suit manufacturer's feminine companion, a tiny, dark-haired woman with a doll face, a touch of epicanthic fold to the eyes. Nice use of epicanthic fold, new expression for me, which means a prolongation of a fold of the skin of the upper eyelid of the, over the inner angle or both angles of the eye. Jessica saw the near perfection of the girl's act, realized. That empty-headed little female is not an empty-headed little female. I like it, but I also wonder whether it's standard to have a capital letter after a colon, even when it's a main clause. Comment down below if you have an opinion. Jessica focused her mind on lathe guns, wondering. The white-hot beams of disruptive light could cut through any known substance, provided that substance was, was not shielded. The fact that feedback from a shield would explode both lace gun and shield did not bother the Harkonnens. Why? It's a nice explanation for why shields has made sword fighting important again. Chapter 17 In which Duncan Idaho gets drunk and then accidentally informs Jessica of his assignment to watch her on behalf of Hawat. This makes her confront Hawat about the, his suspicion of her. The hall seemed to stretch out forever under her running feet. She turned through the arch at the end, dashed past the dining hall and down the passage to the great hall, finding the place brightly lighted, all the wall suspensors glowing at maximum. The nice description in a capitalized great hall. Hmm. To her right, near the front entry, she saw two house guards holding Duncan Idaho between them. His head lolled forward, and there was an abrupt panting silence to the scene. Nice use of panting silence. Maeve shrugged, headed for the kitchen. Her unlaced desert boots slap-slapped against the stone floor. Nice use of slap-slapped. Jessica crossed to the deep, old-fashioned armchair with an embroidered cover of schlag skin, moved the chair into position to command the door. Nice use of schlag and command. Pale rose light glowed from the suspensor lamps. She dimmed them, sat down in the armchair, patted the upholstery, appreciating the chair's regal heaviness for this occasion. Staging is key. She watched him without moving from the chair, seeing the crackling sense of drug-induced energy in his movements, seeing the fatigue beneath. Nice to see a description of the downsides to the meds they pop like candy. She stared at him, thinking of the duke's men rubbing their woes together in the barracks until you could almost smell the charge there, like burnt isolation. Nice use of rubbing. Does every human have this blind spot, he wondered? Can any of us be ordered into action before he can resist? The idea staggered him. Who could stop a person with such power? Jessica has used a voice on him to show that if she wanted to manipulate the duke, she could easily do so, and it makes me wonder how secret this ability is, since Hawat is a mentat who is supposed to have an, an inordinate amount of knowledge. This whole bit lends to that question about magical classes you should be able to answer about why they aren't rulers of the universe. Chapter 18 In which Yue's betrayal goes off without a hitch. Leto finds Mapes dying, killed by Yue so he can, can disable the shield generator and then the duke, putting a poison tooth in his mouth so that he can take the Baron with him, and this in exchange for the lives of Jessica and Paul, whose escape Yue has orchestrated. 
He had slipped into the night like a smoky shadow. Nice use of smoky shadow. The smallest of suspensors had been spaced about eight meters apart along here and tuned to the dimmest levels. The dark stone walls swallowed the light. Nice use of swallowed. He touched her shoulder, and she lifted herself on her elbows, head tipped up to peer at him. The eyes black-shadowed emptiness. Nice use of black-shadowed emptiness. I find it very strange myself, an override on my poetic conscience, but I wish to kill a man. Yes, I actually wish it. I will stop at nothing to do it. This is a new word for me, piratic. Off or relating to fever, fibra. And as far as I understand it, the reason that the Baron could undo the conditioning is because he managed to inspire Yue with desperation to kill him, something that is itself against the conditioning. Which at first seemed extremely clever to me, but the more I think about it, it's like blackmail is a really basic kind of leverage, right? So wouldn't the conditioning have been harshly tested against that weakness? Both the feudal and capitalistic aspects of this society are extremely brutal. Surely, there would have been tests in which conditioned people would see their children murdered in front of them. Slaves are nothing strange to this society, and you can buy a mentat or Bene Gesserit-like items. But then again, I, I did just see the first season of Foundation, and the emperor in that show is might have a affected my judgment on that. The old doctor leaned closer and closer until his face and drooping mustache dominated Leto's narrowing vision. Nice use of dominated. I made a shaitan's bargain with the baron. Another new word with an Arabic origin. An evil spirit, specifically one of the rebellious jinn that led men astray. Nice twist on a Faustian bargain, and exceptionally well applicable to the situation. Chapter 19 In which Jessica is confronted with a betrayal in a conversation between the Baron and Piter. I do appreciate to some extent that we aren't babied with explicit condemnation of the bad characters. For instance, the Baron has promised to give Jessica the Piter, but convinces him that he would be better served accepting the rule of Arrakis because Jessica is too dangerous to keep around. He explains this danger by saying that Yue has informed him of Paul's powers, so the Baron is thus giving him up in much the same way. Paul is 15 and small for his age, and Vladimir is obviously actually evil, even though the text doesn't condemn him for wanting to take a child as a sex slave. Jessica also learns of the Emperor's involvement, which means the Reverend Mother's involvement, but this doesn't bias her against the Bene Gesserit. She and Paul is taken to be dumped in the desert, but they get the upper hand. She could not understand why her mind and body felt so sluggish. Skin raspings of fear ran along her nerves. Nice use of raspings, which word didn't recognize. According to Marian Webster, it means a particle or piece separated by rasping. It was a dull sound, directionless in the dark, somewhere. Nicely evocative. The waiting moment was packed with time, with rustling needle stick movement. Really nice description of her physical impairment and her experience in waiting for it to pass. She tested the bindings, realized they were crimscal fiber, would only claw tighter as she pulled. It's nice to get a descriptor for the alien word. It has come, she thought. How simple it was to subdue the Bene Gesserit. All it took was treachery. How what was right. Yeah, depending on the shared hatred with your subordinate isn't too reliable. She sensed a diminishing in the dark. It began with shadows. Dimensions separated became new thorns of awareness. White, a line under a door. Nice use of thorns of awareness. The fat cheeks were two cherubic mounds beneath spider black eyes. With a nice use of contrast and evil likeness. 
Jessica heard the clue tones in the man's voice, allowed herself an inward shudder. How could the Baron have made such an animal out of a mentat? I like this because one presented difference between Hawat and Piter is that Piter is addicted to, to spice. So it raises question about what will happen to Paul, trained as a mentat. And it's a grave insult from a Bene Gesserit to call someone an animal. Is my Leto dead then? Jessica asked herself. She felt a silent wail begin somewhere in her mind. Nice use of silent wail. Yoke, I, remember, I am giving up the boy. You heard what the traitor said about the lad's training. They are alike, this mother and son. Deadly. Yeah, he sucks. So much. The mind-calming Bene Gesserit regimen his mother had taught him kept him poised, ready to expand any opportunity. Nice use of expand. Logic said the traitor was UA, but he held final decision in abeyance. There was no understanding it. A sook doctor, a traitor. Nice use of abeyance. Then they were on sand, feet grating in it. Nice description. Seagull cut off his wing rotors. Silence flooded in upon them. Nice use of flooded. Paul stared around them, saw the rock scarp lifting out of the desert like a beach rising from the sea, wind-carved palisades beyond. Nice use of wind-carved palisades. Chapter 20. I think. By my count. It is a very short chapter in which we see how Yue added in Paul and Jessica's escape, how he arranged for supplies and for the ducal ring to pass to Paul. He lowered his gaze, pressed past the Sardaukar, knowing this as a foretaste of how history would remember him, Yue the traitor. So true, Irulan has not been kind to him in the introduction quote. Chapter 21 In which Leto dies, and Vladimir narrowly escaped death himself from Yue's planted false tooth. We learn that the Baron first intended to use Piter to give the people someone to hate, before being replaced by the chosen Harkonnen heir, Fae Drautha. Piter dies from the poison gas, so the Mar Baron must use his other nephew, the already hated Raban. I do remember the death scene as vastly different. The Baron here is rattled by his close shave, when he is only triumphant in the miniseries. The thought was a shuckle in his mind. Nice. There was a motion of men just outside the door. The mutton faces of his guard, their expressions carefully cheat-like in his presence. This says a lot about the Baron. But then again, people treaded softly when the Duke was in a rage. The Baron shifted his attention to the guard captain, Amman Kudu, sister line of jaw muscles, chin like a boot toe, a man to be trusted because the captain's vices were known. Nice use of scissor line. It is interesting that the Baron trusts people whose weaknesses he knows and can exploit, while the Atreides trust people who hate the Harkonnen. He whipped his attention to Piter, watching the man wipe the blade on a scrap of cloth, watching the creamy look of satisfaction in the blue eyes. Nice use of creamy, like the cat who ate it. He knew he had spoken too loudly. This moment, long envisioned, had lost some of its savour. Nice use of savour, and who'da thunk a vendetta wouldn't be all it was built up to be. Leto could feel the chains, the ache of muscles, his cracked lips, his burning cheeks, the dry taste of thirst whispering its grit in his mouth. Nice use of thirst whispering its grit. Time became a sequence of layers for the duke. He drifted up through them. I must wait. Nice use of sequence of layers. Leto sensed increasing definition in his surroundings. The chair beneath him took on firmness. The bindings were sharper. Nice use of definition. And he saw the Baron clearly now. Leto watched the movements of the man's hands. Compulsive touching. The edge of a plate. The handle of a spoon. A finger tracing the fold of a jowl. I really like all the insights into the Baron in this chapter. He is quite banal. And now the memory of the false tooth stood out in his mind like a steeple in a flat landscape. Nice imagery. I've lived for a time on this planet, share cousin. Nice use of share. 
This thought calmed the Baron, overcoming his reluctance to have a royal person subjected to pain. He saw himself suddenly as a surgeon exercising endless subtle scissor dissections, cutting away the masks from fools, exposing the hell beneath. He's terrible. Both that he thinks that nobility should be exempt from pain, and that it's so easy for him to justify torturing Leto anyway. He found himself remembering an antenna kite up dangling in the shell blue sky of Caladan, and Paul laughing with joy at the sight of it. Nice use of the non word up dangling, and it's so telling about the difference in priorities between Leto and Vladimir. Leto sensed memories rolling in his mind, the old toothless mutterings of hags. Old women upgraded to hags, though I don't know what the upgrade means. Are the mutterings of hags less coherent, maybe? The room, the table, the baron, a pair of terrified eyes, blue within blue, the eyes, all compressed around him in ruined symmetry. Lovely use of ruined symmetry. The toy man had a broken nose slanted to the left, an offbeat metronome caught forever at the start of an upward stroke. Lovely imagery of the death of Piter and the guard captain. Nefud was addicted to Simuta, the drug music combination that played itself in the deepest consciousness. Fascinating stuff. Reminds me of that episode in Stargate SG-1 with the narcotic pleasure palace. And Nefud is the new guard captain. So, it was a coldly controlled word and the Baron felt proud of it. He really does like to pat himself on the back for things. The Colonel Bashar remained planted facing the Baron. Not by flicker of eye or muscle did he acknowledge he had been dismissed. The interactions with the Sardaukar really shows how highly stationed they are, and since they probably take their cues from the Emperor, how little the Emperor cares for the Baron. Chapter 22 Pa and Jessica have been briefly joined by Duncan Idaho, who then leaves them again, Paul's spice consumption reaches the critical mass to unleash his superpowers along with a numbness to his feelings. The beginnings of the oh-so-fantastically rendered tragedy of Paul's life. He both has to accept his father's mortality along with the limitations of his mother and the actual repercussions of his training. Among the things he knows that he shouldn't is that Jessica is the Baron Har Harkonnen's daughter along with her being pregnant with a girl. But Paul had known, as he turned, who piloted the thopter. An accumulation of minutia in the way it was flown, the dash of the landing, clues so small even his mother hadn't detected them, had told Paul precisely who sat at those controls. Nice use of minutia. But he felt nothing except, here's an important fact. It was one with all the other facts. All the while his mind was adding sense impressions, extrapolating, computing. It is really skillful to elicit sympathy for Paul as his character is elevated, and it makes very clear what it is to be a mentat. But he felt no let up in the cold precision of his being. He sensed that his new awareness was only a beginning, that it was growing. The sense of terrible purpose he'd first experienced in his ordeal with the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mahayam pervaded him. His right hand, the hand of remembered pain tingled and throbbed. Nice use of cold precision. Jessica turned away, frightened of the bitter strength in her son's voice, hearing the precise assessment of chances. She sensed that his mind had leaped ahead of her, that it now saw more in some respects than she did. She had helped train the intelligence which did this, but now she found herself fearful of it. So she's fearful of it but she's still prioritizing teaching her daughter to become a Bene Gesserit, even though her abilities are comparable to Paul's. Hmm. I know I'm jumping ahead, but it's still curious to me. He turned away from her, looking out into the night. Why can't I mourn, he wondered. He felt that every fiber of his being craved this release, but it would be denied him forever. Tragic. It reads like the Ashar book, she thought, recalling her studies of the great secrets. Has a manipulator of religion been on Arrakis? Absolutely fascinating. I want to know more about the great secrets as well as manipulators of religion. 
Without even the safety valve of dreaming, he focuses prescient awareness, seeing it as a computation of most probable futures, but with something more, an edge of mystery, as though his mind dipped into some timeless stratum and sampled the winds of the future. There will be a lot of samples of description of Paul's power because they are really cool. <laughs> But the idea of living out his life in the mind groping ahead through possible futures that guided hurtling spaceships appalled him. It is fascinating that lacking advanced computers like AI, a person would require the ability of short-term prescience to navigate interstellar travel. I was, I am, I remain a hint confused about how navigators, the spacing guild, are treated in the books because I remember these things being obvious in the miniseries. I have another kind of sight. I see another kind of terrain, the available path. The awareness conveyed both reassurance and alarm. So many places on that other kind of terrain dipped or turned out of his sight. And he's 15 years old. Certain gene traces in her facial structure were noted in the new way by his unflowing mind, the clues added to other data, and a final summation answer to put forward. I am not a fan of parentheses in fiction, but it's still an excellent sentence. So here we live out our lives, she thought, on this hell planet. The place is prepared for us if we can evade the Harkonnens, and there's no doubt of my course, a brood mare preserving an important bloodline for the Bene Gesserit plan. And she still believes in it. It doesn't mess her up that she's the daughter of the Harkonnen Baron, that it has been kept from her in the hope that she would have a daughter to be married to Fade. Jessica is the most complicated character in this book, and in particular, in the third part, I do have a hard time reconciling her various sides. So many blank ends of meaning in her past reached out now and linked. The daughter the Bene Gesserit wanted, it wasn't to end the old Archades Harkonnen feud, but to fix some genetic factor in their lines. Via incest, let's not forget. He remained silent, thinking like the seed he was thinking with a race consciousness he had first experienced as terrible purpose. He found that he no longer could hate the Bene Gesserit, or the Emperor, or even the Harkonnens. They were all caught up in the need of their races to renew its scattered inheritance, to cross and mingle and infuse their bloodlines in a great new pooling of genes. And the race knew only one sure way for this, the ancient way, the tried and certain way that rolled over everything in its path, Yihad. This is one of the major premises for the whole book that you just have to accept. I'm not sure that a universe encompassing holy war is the surefire way to mingle ying poles, but I'm fine with my disbelief being suspended on that point. It is the opposite to the Bene Gesserit planning. He looked up, staring across the green lighted tent at the inbred patrician lines of her face. I can't remember seeing inbred and patrician next to each other like this. Patrician is usually a compliment, but yeah, maintaining nobility does mean inbreeding. And the Bene Gesserit purposefully keep their members ignorant of their heritage so they won't refuse to breed with genetically closed men. Wonderful. Book 2. Muad'Dib. See? This is going well. More than a third way through all of the quotes I have, which is a good sign. I think I can do this all now. Probably. We'll see. It's pretty late already, but who cares? Chapter 23. Paul is already beginning to plot how to avoid the terrible purpose, the Yehad, which is the default way for humanity to refresh the impulse. They decide to give up waiting for Duncan Idaho. He blamed my mother and the compact forced on him to place a Bene Gesserit on the throne. This is Irulan talking about the emperor. Nice use of compact. And it makes me more curious about what the Bene Gesserit had to do to make the emperor agree to this. Jessica followed automatically, noting how she now lived in her son's orbit. 
And I don't know how she feels about that. It doesn't sound like a good thing, but it isn't condemned by the text either. This world has emptied me of all but the oldest purpose, Tamara's life. I live now for my young duke and the daughter yet to be. And yet, she remains entirely focused on Leto and his ducal heritage. Chapter 24 Hawat manages to escape with a handful of men, finding Fremen for temporary allies. He is convinced that Jessica is the traitor. We learn that the Fremen are a match for the Sardaukar, which leads the Sardaukar to want to wipe them out, because it's important to the Sardaukar identity that they are the most threatening force in the universe. At least I think so. It is all to no avail as Hawat is captured by attacking Sardaukar. Hawat's shocked fury had mounted until it threatened the smooth functioning of his mentat capabilities. The sight of the attack struck his mind like a physical blow. We learn later that it's not a given that space travel is that expensive. It's all on the discretion of the spacing guild. With a self-accusing bitterness, he faced the thought of the soldier fanatics and the imperial treachery they represented. His mental assessment of the data told him how little chance he had ever to present evidence of this treachery before the High Council of the Landsrad, where justice might be done. And this apparently means that he gives up on this plan. If only we'd had the time to link up with these Fremen, he Hawat thought. It was a sour lament in his mind. If only we could have trained them and armed them. Great mother, what a fighting force we'd have had. Nice use of sour lament. He doesn't even see the problem, Hawat thought. The naivete of the Fremen was frightening. I have a somewhat hard time accepting the extent of the Fremen naivete. They have been exposed to off-world, off-worlders for a really long time, so it feels weird that they don't know the major points where the cultures differ. Abruptly, the sand around the two groups sprouted Fremen. Nice use of sprouted. Chapter 25 Duncan Idaho returns for the pair with Kynes and a bunch of Fremen, who take them to a Fremen hideout. Kynes internally debates why he takes the risks to help them against his imperial orders, and it is because he has faith that Paul will be good for Arrakis. Paul lays out that he, he will use blackmail against the emperor to make him marry his way to the throne, the threat being to play out the great house's fear that the emperor will do to them what he has done to Leto. Paul manages to gain Kynes loyalty with promises to repay in kind. The hiding place is then discovered by the enemy, Duncan Idaho is killed, and Kynes sends Paul and Jessica away in a thopter. Paul flies them into a sandstorm which convinces their pursuers that they are dead. The craft and its companions settled into the basin like a covey of birds coming to nest. Nice use of covey. The Fremen removed a rock plug that opened a passage down into the native basement complex off the desert. Nice use of native basement complex. Paul followed his mother's example, gestalting the room, seeing the workbenches down one side, the walls of featureless rock, instruments lined the bench, Dials glowing, wire grid explains with fluting glass emerging from them, an ozone smell permeated the place. Cool description and nice use of gestalt, even though it's not a verb. Some of the Fremen moved on around a concealing angle in the chamber and new sounds started there. Machine coughs, the whinnies of spinning belts and multi-drives. Nice use of concealing angle. In this moment he'd give his life for Paul, she thought. How do the Atreides accomplish this thing so quickly, so easily? I wonder whether the Atreides actually have this skill or if Jessica is romanticizing things. Somewhere this night, he had passed a decision nexus into the deep unknown. He knew the time area surrounding them, but the here and now existed as a place of mystery. It's excellent to see some limitation to Paul's powers. Before, it seemed to be somewhat like the ability to see, see all possible futures in the right circumstances, but clearly not. Like with all magic, the limitations are key. 
and he realized with an abrupt sense of shock that he had been giving more and more reliance to prescient memory and it had weakened him for this particular emergency. Excellent. A white patch of dust-blurred stars framed in angular darkness appeared where the door wall had been. Nice use of dust-blurred and angular darkness. Beyond stretched moonlit fingernail shadows, dunes diminishing one into another. Nice use of fingernail shadows and diminishing. Chapter 26 The new Harkening Guard Captain informs the Baron of Paul's and Jessica's assumed deaths and the duplicity of Kynes. The Baron's orders Kynes to be killed, despite his employment for the Emperor. The Baron declares that he intends to replace the dead Pider with Hawat. Hawat is to be irreversibly poisoned, unbeknownst to him, and then secretly fed the regular antidote. We learn that Vladimir will use Raban to torment the inhabitants of Arrakis, so that Fade can show up as a kind of rescuer and he intends for Fade to become Emperor eventually. The Baron shifted his gross body in the suspensors, focuses attention on an Ebeline statue of a leaping boy in a niche across the room. Ebeline is another Dune word, and here I didn't like it because I for some reason first thought that Ebeline was like a style of sculpture rather than a material, but then it would be capitalized. It was just an unnecessary stumble in my mind. Hawat, unfortunately, had a master whose resources were poor, one who could not elevate a mentat to the sublime peaks of reasoning that are a mentat's right. It sounds to me that being a mentat is terrible, and it should rather not be done to them when they're too young to consent. Nobody cares in this universe. His voice fell flat and lifeless in the energy-blanketed room. Nice use of energy blanketed, and nice to show that the Baron is shielding himself because he is suspicious of even his own family. Strength poured into the Baron's voice. I suborned a doctor of the Sook school, the inner school. The need to brag is so telling, and nice use of suborned. The Baron felt anger at himself. He felt betrayed. His feelings are very sensitive, aren't they? And not for the first time, the Baron wondered if there ever would come a day when the guild might be circumvented. They were insidious, bleeding off just enough to keep the host from objecting until they had you in their fist, where they could force you to pay and pay and pay. It's not the last time the guild is likened to a parasite. Does my lord forget that I was his regent Sirudar here before? The wiki? has three alternatives for which word is the basis for Siridar here. In universe, it means planetary. Well, the Sardaukar think they were Fremen. The Sardaukar already have launched a program to wipe out all Fremen. Here was such a strange change between additions to me because they changed pogrom to program. So I started wondering whether pogrom might be offensive. It would be a shame, because it's such a usefully specific word, but the text goes back to Pogrom in two chapters. <laughs> Chapter 27 Paul manages to fly them through the storm because of his new superpowers. Paul and Jessica barely survive encounters with a worm twice, and survive until they encounter the Fremen pack sent by Kynes. As Paul fought the Thopter's controls, he grew aware that he was sorting out the interwoven storm forces, his more than mentat awareness computing on the basis of fractional minutia. He felt dust fronts, billowings, mixings of turbulence, an occasional vortex. Still great use of minutia. It's one of my favorite words. I don't get to use it enough. They slogged towards the rock, sand gripping their feet. Nice use of slogged and gripping. Running on sand, generally. Mm, not, not my fave. A new sound began to impress itself on them. A muted whisper, a hissing, an abrasive slithering. Nice use of impress. He had seen this desert, but the set of the vision had been subtly different, like an optical image that had disappeared into his consciousness, been absorbed by memory and now failed of perfect registry when projected onto the real scene. Cool. Paul stopped in a bite of rock, leaned the pack against a narrow ledge. 
new word to me, bite. Here meaning a bend or curve, especially in a river or a mountain chain. Specifically, a bend in a coast forming an open bay. The desert is frequently likened to an ocean in this book, and I really like it. It lay there, full of moon-silvered waves, shadows of angles that lapsed into curves, and, in the distance, lifted to the misted grey blur of another escarpment. Nice use of moon-silvered and lapsed. An eider wind feathered Paul's cheeks, ruffled the folds of his burnous. Two more new words, eider and burnous. Eider means feathers, down, and burnous is a one-piece hooded cloak worn, worn by Arabs and Berbers. In the Bene Gesserit way she had taught him, Paul stilled the savage beating of his heart, set his mind as a blank slate upon which the past few moments could write themselves. Every partial shift and twist of the slide replayed itself in his memory, moving with an interior stateliness that contrasted with a fractional second of real time required for the total recall. Cool. He lowered his binoculars, rubbed beneath his filter baffle, feeling how dry and chapped his lips were, sensing the dusty taste of thirst in his mouth. Baffle, noun. A device, such as a plate, wall, or screen, to deflect, check, or regulate flow or passage, as of a fluid, light, or sound. Nice. Restless heat devils were beginning to set the air a quiver out on the open sand. The other rock face across from them was like a thing seen through cheap glass. Nice use of a quiver and really nice simile. It came from the right with an uncaring majesty that could not be ignored. Nice use of uncaring majesty. In particular, in regards to a sandworm. Whatever has been done to me, I've been a party to it, he thought. And yeah, he did agree to continue his menta training, so he must have been okay with it. But the choice was instantly rewarded with pride from his idolized father, so of course he agreed to it. I, I don't agree that he was much party to it. Chapter 28 Gurney Halleck is alive and currently working with smugglers. He fails to rally the smugglers to immediately fight the Harkonnens. Even though he believes all the Atreides are dead, he finds out that Raban will again rule, and Gurney has a personal vendetta against Raban. We see how Gurney cares for his remaining handful of men who survived the attack. He saw the family resemblance in the smuggler now, the father's heavy, overhanging eyebrows and the rock planes of cheek and nose. Nice use of overhanging eyebrows and rock planes. He frowned, watched the play of muscles along Halleck's jaw, the sudden withdrawal in the man's shed-lidded eyes. Nice use of shed-lidded eyes. Move slowly and the day of your revenge will come, Tuek said. Speed is a device of Shaitan. Shaitan again. So I guess it is a universal demon figure in this culture. Chapter 29 the introduction of which tells us a lot about the Emperor and his seemingly only friend, Count Fenring. Fenring, who is married to the Bene Gesserit who left a coded message for Jessica on Arrakis. It is specified, for one, that the Emperor has an agreement with the Bene Gesserit and the Guild, which says that he may only have daughters. The daughters are, them, are themselves trained to be Bene Gesserit. It makes you wonder what the, what the guild has to gain from this arrangement, considering the Reverend Mother's hostility toward them. One of the slave concubines permitted my father, under the Bene Gesserit guild agreement, could not, of course, bear a royal successor. But the intrigues were constant and oppressive in their similarity. I find it fascinating that they were oppressive, because they were repetitive. She had a dancer's muscles, and her training obviously had included neuro enticement. In this world, it's not a, enough for someone to be sexually attractive. You have to be able to manipulate someone psychologically. Folds upon folds of dunes spread beyond their shelter. Away from the setting sun, the dunes exposed greased shadows so black they were like bits of knife. 
nice use of greased shadows. And here I thought lightning was the most greased natural feature. Hmm. His mind searched for something tall in that landscape, but there was no persuading tallness out of the heat-addled air and that horizon. No bloom or gently shaken thing to mark the passage of a breeze. Only dunes and that cliff beneath a sky of burnished silver blue. Nice use of persuading. I'll strike camp, Paul said. I did not know that you used strike to mean to disassemble a camp. The sun dipped lower. Shadows stretched across the salt pan. Lines of wild color spread over the sunset horizon. Color streamed into a toe of darkness testing the sand. Cold colored shadows spread and the thick collapse of night blotted the desert. Here I am mostly just appreciating the wonderful nature descriptions. Feeling inadequate, that is not one of my strong suits. The desert night focused upward with a feeling of lift toward the stars. The weight of the day proceeded. A very evocative description. The night wind spread sand runnels that grated across her, bringing the smell of cinnamon, a shower of odors in the dark. This nice application of shower to a smell. A sill of silver pushed above the horizon to their right. The first moon. Nice use of sill. A grating sound of fury exploded from the rock shadows they had left. It was a flailing avalanche of noise. Nice use of avalanche with the abstract noise. He saw that they had reached an unmarked point where the two rock faces, the one ahead and the one behind, appeared equally remote. Nice. She nodded, knowing he did not see the gesture, but needing the action to tell herself it was necessary to demand more from muscles that already were being taxed to their limit. The unnatural movement. Ellipsis. Full stop. It's so easy to imagine the tiredness. The sand and gravel dragged at their feet, and the hissing approach of the worm was a storm sound that grew around them. Nice use of storm sound. She felt it through her feet, the shock of unresisting surface, gained new strength from firmer footing. I'm a hint confused here? A hard surface gives resistance, doesn't it? Isn't rock more resisting than sand? What do you think? Where the dunes began, perhaps 50 meters away at the foot of a rocky beach, a silver-gray curve broached from the desert, sending rivers of sand and dust cascading all around. It lifted higher, resolved into a giant questing mouth. It was a round black hole with edges glistening in the moonlight. Cool. An answer lay poised at the edge of his awareness, but refused to come. Lovely. His ears searched, found only sounds he could expect. A tiny spill of sand, an insect burr, the patter of a small running creature. Nice use of the onomatopoeic burr. Yeah. The steps ended in a slitted defile about 20 meters long. It's floor level, and this opened onto a shallow, moonlit basin. Nice use of slitted defile. The tube's cap grated against flakes of sand as she replaced it. The sensory descriptions of the desert hits really well throughout this whole thing, I think. He inhaled, sensed the softly cutting contralto smell of sage climbing the night. Nice use of softly cutting contralto. Contralto is a music term of a kind of vo vocal range. I'm not really sure how it applies, but I like it. It had brought the stillness to the basin so unuttered that the blue milk moonlight could almost be heard flowing across sentinel saguro and spiked paint bush. Nice use of unuttered and blue milk moonlight. There was a low humming of light here, more basic in its harmony than any other music in his universe. Nice use of low humming of light. Chapter 30 this is one of my favorite chapters. A dying Liet Kynes hallucinates a conversation with the disembodied voice of his dead father. We learn so much about Arrakis in a very creative way. 
is also telling that he's not thinking about his daughter in his dying moment, but it can't really be held against him. He is delirious from wandering the desert. The man stopped half across the dune crest, arms stretched down the slip face. Blood had clotted on his back and on his arms and legs. Patches of yellow-gray sand clung to the wounds. Nice use of dune crest and slip face. Also, ick, about the wounds. I am Liet Kynes, he said, addressing himself to the empty horizon, and his voice was a hoarse caricature of the strength it had known. Nice use of hoarse caricature. But he could still smell the rank, semi-sweet esters of a pre-spice pocket somewhere underneath the sand. He knew the peril within this fact more certainly than any other Fremen. If he could smell the pre-spice mass, that meant the gases deep under the sand were nearing explosive pressure. He had to get away from here. Cool. I totally accept this science. I don't understand. Uh, to me, it sound based on real science. Esters is also a Herbert word, I believe. But it's evocative of something fume-like to me. This is a spice desert, he thought. There must be Fremen about, even in the day sun. Surely they can see the birds and will investigate. If I hadn't known that Kynes dies, I might feel some tension here. Difficult to say now. The hawk hopped one step closer to Kynes' outstretched hand, turned its head first one way and then the other to study the exposed flesh. I don't usually pay attention to birds, so I'm making a note of descriptions of bird behavior. Arrakis is a one-crop planet, his father said. One crop. It supports a ruling class that lives as ruling classes have lived in all times, while beneath them, a semi-human mass of semi-slaves exists on the leavings. It's the masses and the leavings that occupy our attention. These are far more valuable than has ever been suspected. Referring to the Fremen as semi-human, is telling of Kynes' father's attitude about them. He was the planetologist there before Kynes. The masses of Arrakis will know we work to make the land flow with water, his father said. Most of them, of course, will have only a semi-mystical understanding of how we intend to do this. Many, not understanding the prohibitive mass ratio problem, may even think we'll bring water from some other planet rich in it. Let them think anything they wish, as long as they believe in us. Nice use of prohibitive mass ratio problem. But I'm slightly confused again. Because why can't they bring water to the planet when they're constantly removing spice from it? But again, I accept the premise. Religion and law among our masses must be one and the same, his father said. An act of disobedience must be a sin and require religious penalties. This will have the dual benefit of bringing both greater obedience and greater bravery. We must depend not so much on the bravery of individuals, you see, as upon the bravery of the whole population. It is interesting that it's not just the Bene Gesserit who have the idea of manipulation through religion. He wanted to turn his head, to stare in the direction of his father's voice, stare the old man down. Muscles refused to answer his demand. Such nice poeticism, so close to death. A profound clarity filled Kynes' mind. He saw quite suddenly a potential for Arrakis that his father had never seen. The possibilities along the different path flooded through him. No more terrible disaster could befall your people than for them to fall into the hands of a hero, his father said. I infer that he now realizes the terrible purpose, that his and his father's manipulation has boosted this potential. Somewhere beneath him, the pre-spice mass had accumulated enough water and organic matter from the little makers, had reached the critical stage of wild growth. A gigantic bubble of carbon dioxide was forming deep in the sand, heaving upward in an enormous blow with a dust whirlpool at its center. It would exchange what had been formed deep in the sand for whatever lay on the surface. Sure, if you say so. For a moment, the sensation of coolness and the moisture were blessed relief. Then, as his planet killed him, it occurred to Kynes that his father and all the other scientists were wrong. 
that the most persistent principles of the universe were accident and error. Nice use of his planet. And yeah, this whole setup feels like a coincidence of errors. Chapter 31. I really like this chapter too, because it props up Jessica's abilities after she's been hampered by her grief and overshadowed by Paul having realized his spice-powered ability. The Fremen group that found them, led by Stilgar, are skeptical of the value of keeping them alive, which leads to a brief fight uh, until Jessica overpowers Stilgar. And there's also a very sweet, cute meet with Cheney, whom Paul recognizes from his prescient dreams. And Paul fought down his fear, glanced at his mother. His trained eyes saw her readiness for battle, the waking whip-snap of her muscles. Nice use of whip-snap. A tall man in a mottled burnous stepped in front of Jessica. His mouth baffle was thrown aside for clear speech, revealing a heavy beard in the sidelight of the moon, but face and eyes were hidden in the overhang of his hood. Nice use of sidelight and overhang. Jessica put all the royal arrogance at her command into her manner and voice. Reply was urgent, but she had not heard enough of this man to be certain she had a register on his culture and weaknesses. Another nice description of the voice and its limitations. The Bernus hooded head showed tension in a sudden twist, then slow relaxation that revealed much. The man had good control. Bene Gesserit are body language experts, so it won't be called a pseudoscience in the future then. The hooded head turned at Paul's movement, opening a wedge of face to moonlight. Nice use of wedge of face. Jessica heard the shading of disgust in his voice held herself prepared for attack. And the disgust here is for Jessica wanting to stay alive despite being a burden to the group. The desert is very harsh. And Jessica heard him excluding her from his thoughts. Had he already passed sentence? Kynes apparently only told Stilgar that he had to save Paul, so the oh-so-practical Fremen would render Jessica for her water. Stilgar flicked a glance across Paul, but kept his attention on Jessica. Nice use of flicked. Jessica's motion started as a slumping, deceptive feint to the ground. It was the obvious thing for a weak outworlder to do, and the obvious slows an opponent's reactions. It takes an instant to interpret a known thing when that thing is exposed as something unknown. It is a hint weird that Jessica has to show martial prowess for the Fremen to even consider that she might be useful kept alive. I, there must be other things, I don't know. I found it strange. Then I shall teach you my way of battle, Jessica said, and she sensed the unconscious ritual intensity of her words. Nice use of ritual intensity. Jessica sighed, thinking. So our Missionaria Protectiva even planted religious safety valves all through this hellhole. Ah, well, it'll help, and that's what it was meant to do. I don't really see which parts of the Missionaria Protectiva that haven't been religious. It's all been about Paul maybe being a prophesied messiah. The revelation shook him, and Jessica thought, if only he knew the tricks we use. She must have been good, that Bene Gesserit of the Missionaria Protectiva. These Fremen are beautifully prepared to believe in us. I am Cheney, daughter of Liette. The voice was lilting, half filled with laughter. Ah, Also, oh, on um, being the daughter of Liette. That girl, she was like a touch of destiny. He felt caught up on a wave, in tune with emotion that lifted all his spirits. Ah, so nice, so sweet. Chapter 32 Another really good chapter about Jessica's introduction to Stilgar. I really like this Stilgar. I don't remember liking him in, in the miniseries. But this one I would totally ship with Jessica if she hadn't been in love with the Duke. The timing is a hint too bad to overcome, I think. 
Jessica is obliged to choose which role she will subsume in Fremen culture to ensure her safety. And she goes with religious leader rather than properly married to a Fremen man. The Fremen were supreme in that quality the ancients called Spannungsbogen, which is the self-imposed delay between desire for a thing and the act of reaching out to grasp that thing. Here's another very clever evolution of the meaning of a term. Spannungsbogen is German and literally means the tensing of a bow, most commonly used to refer to the raising of tension in a fictional work. I love it. He straightened, studied the place, a deep and wide area with domed ceiling that curved away just out of a man's hand reach. Nice use of hand reach. We must be getting back to the others, Stelgar said, else my people may suspect I dally with you. Some already are jealous that my hands tasted your loveliness when we struggled last night in Tawana Basin. Yeah, all right, sit down. Come on. Jessica stared out into the sunlight. She had heard what she had heard in Stilgar's voice, the unspoken offer of more than his countenance. Did he need a wife? She realized she could step into that place with him. It would be one way to end the conflict over tribal leadership. Female properly aligned with male. <laughs> Patriarchy. So sorry, I don't know what, what came over me. It's just been building in the back of my throat throughout this book. There are those among my young men who have reached the age of wild spirit, he said. They must be eased through this period. I must leave no great reasons around for them to challenge me, because I would have to maim and kill among them. This is not the proper course for a leader if it can be avoided with honor. A leader, you see, is one of the things that distinguishes a mob from a people. He maintains the level of individuals. Too few individuals and a people reverts to a mob. I think this is another elegant way of showing the Bene Gesserit influence or a way to show a universal truth. The Bene Gesserit have their breeding program in part to preserve their definition of human individuals in the masses of people. They are needed to keep a people from reverting back to a barbarian state. What is his ancestry? She wondered. Whence comes such breeding? Jessica confirming that he is human, and it's a nice correct use of whens. When it's used incorrectly is a pet peeve of mine, so I'm always happy when I see it like this. I should like an end to this, he said. I should like friendship with you and trust. I should like that respect for each other which grows in the breast without demand for the huddlings of sex. Here I wasn't sure if he meant sex as in sexual or as in the groupings of gender. She knew the cant of the Missionaria Protectiva, knew how to adapt the techniques of legend and fear and hope to her emergency needs. But she sensed wild changes here, as though someone had been among these Fremen and capitalized on the Missionaria Protectiva's imprint. I'm guessing that this is Liat Kynes, and before him, his father. Her mind felt as though it had rolled over within her. She recognized the sensation with a quickening of pulse. Nothing in all the Bene Gesserit training carried such a signal of recognition. It could only be the adab, the demanding memory that comes upon you of itself. She gave herself up to it, allowing the words to flow from her. She is an exceptional individual besides being Bene Gesserit. And she felt a cynical bitterness at what she had done. Our Missionaria Protectiva seldom fails. A place was prepared for us in this wilderness. The prayer of the Salat has carved out our hiding place. Now I must play the part of Aluya, the friend of God, Sayadina to rogue peoples who've been so heavily imprinted with our Bene Gesserit soothsay they even call their chief priestesses reverend mothers. I assume that all of this preparation must have been done a very long time ago for that not to be taught a taught fact in the Bene Gesserit schools and that feels a hint careless to assume that the prophecy to exploit would remain after all that time but I don't know I, I want to know more Paul took a deep breath trying to still the tempest within him there is a tempest in him 
you guys. If you know, you know. His mother's words had locked onto the working of the spice essence, and he had felt her voice rise and fall within him like the shadows of an open fire. Through it all, he had sensed the edge of cynicism in her. He knew her so well, but nothing could stop this thing that had begun with a morsel of food. It is very cynical of both of them to go with this, but Paul markedly has a selfless motivation behind his choices. And it is startling to me that the texts never seem to acknowledge that there is an option that neither Paul or Jessica considers, which is simply to survive, to live among the Fremen. And that's not explored by the text. And I find that very interesting. How about you? Awareness flowed into that timeless stratum where he could view time, sensing the available past, the winds of the future, the winds of the past, the one-eyed vision of the past, the one-eyed vision of the present, and the one-eyed vision of the future, all combined in a trinocular vision that permitted him to see time become space. More cool description of Paul's powers as he consumed spies. There was danger, he felt, of overrunning himself and he had to hold on to his awareness of the present, sensing the blurred deflection of experience, the flowing moment, the continual solidification of that which is into the perpetual what. Nice use of overrunning and solidification. In grasping the present, he felt for the first time the massive steadiness of time's movement everywhere, complicated by shifting currents, waves, surges, and countersurges, like surf against rocky cliffs. It gave him a new understanding of his prescience, and he saw the source of blind time, the source of error in it, with an immediate sensation of fear. The prescience, he realized, was an illumination that incorporated the limits of what it revealed, at once a source of accuracy and meaningful error. A kind of Heisenberg indeterminacy intervened. The expenditure of energy that revealed what he saw changed what he saw. I didn't know what the Heisenberg indeterminacy was, but Merriam Webster says the Heisenberg principle is also known as the uncertainty principle, which is a principle in quantum mechanics. It is impossible to discern simultaneously and with high accuracy both the position and the momentum of a particle. And I understand that because it was explained to me in Stargate SG-1. I do like me some Stargate and I'm not sorry about it. And what he saw was a time nexus within this cave, a boiling of possibilities focused here, where in the most minute action, the wink of an eye, a careless word, a misplaced grain of sand, moved a gigantic lever across the known universe, he saw violence with the outcome subject to so many variables that his slightest movement created vast shiftings in the pattern. The vision made him want to freeze into immobility, but this too was action with its consequences. And I'm continually awed by how sympathetic a character Paul is. Chapter 33 Jamie, whose pride was bruised by Paul the night before, challenges Jessica's claim of being the mother of the Lisan al-Gaib, the voice from the outside world, the messiah. Apparently, part of the prophecy is that she needs no champion among the Fremen, meaning that she has a champion already, and that can only be Paul. I like this setup a lot more than the one in the miniseries, where Jamie calls out Paul simply for injuring him. This way shows complications to the Missionaria Protectiva and that it can be used to the advantage of someone other than who it was designed for. Paul wins painfully because it's the first time he's killed with a knife. He's killed before in the book. I just didn't mention that because it wasn't that important. It wasn't impactful for some reason. So ignore that part. He feels that winning the duel is a step closer to the terrible purpose the fanatic he had in his name. He receives the troop name Zul and chooses to be named for a desert mouse, Muadib, as he has predicted. It continues to show 
that he can foresee big events, but his prescience has limits because any decision can nudge it off the path. How to get a message to the Bene Gesserit, she wondered. They would have to be told of the two strays in Arakin Sanctuary. I like this because it sets Jessica in the role of representing the Bene Gesserit in the story. Even after everything, knowing the relationship between the Reverend Mother and the Emperor, the fact that the Emperor provided troops for the Harkonnen attack, that she's the Baron's daughter, she is still aligned with their agenda and would still trust them with the information that they have survived. Hmm. Stilgar came from shadows to her right, crossed to the group beneath the glow globes. She marked how he fingered his beard and the watchful cat-stalking look of him. I'm not going to reuse the fingering gag. Rather, I appreciate the use of cat-stalking look. Who knows it better, Stilgar asked, and she heard the tone of placation in his voice, the attempt to smooth something over. Stilgar is obviously on Paul's side against Jamis, which is appreciated. Stilgar looked at Jessica, spoke in a low voice, but one designed to carry to the crowd's fringe. Nice use of crowd's fringe, and Stilgar's leadership skills are obvious. Jessica fell silent, staring at him in the green light of the glow globes, seeing the demoniacal stiffness that had taken over his expression. Nice use of demoniacal stiffness. But Paul still felt the nexus boiling of this cave, still remembered the prescient visions of himself dead under a knife. There had been so few avenues of escape for him in that vision. And just think of the trauma of seeing yourself dead over and over and over. You will answer to me then, Jessica said, and she pitched her voice in a twisting tone with a little whine in it and a catch at the end. Yet another nice description of the voice. Jessica saw the girl child Cheney helping Paul, saw her press a crisp knife handle into his palm, saw him heft it, testing the weight and balance. Heft is an excellent word. I will use it more often. Paul crouched, realizing then that he had no shield, but was trained to fighting with its subtle field around him, trained to react on defense with utmost speed while his attack would be timed to the controlled slowness necessary for penetrating the enemy's shield. In spite of constant warning from his trainers not to depend on the shield's mindless blunting of attack speed, he knew that shield awareness was part of him. As with magic, the limitations of technology is excellent. Prescience had fed his knowledge with countless experiences, hinted at the strongest current of the future and the strings of decision that guided them. But this was the real now. This was death hanging on an infinite number of minuscule mischances. Nice use of minuscule mischances. I'm afraid, Paul told himself, which is a very endearing view of a boy of 15 trying to make sense of his feelings. The prescient knowledge of the time-boiling variables in this cave came back to plague him now. His new understanding told him there were too many swiftly compressed decisions in this fight for any clear channel ahead to show itself. Nice use of time-boiling variables. And she found in herself a sense of pity for James, an emotion tempered by awareness of the immediate peril to her son. It was tragic for James to assume that Paul would be an easy kill because he's not of the desert. However, maybe a hint too naive? I don't know, what do you think? Memory of Duncan Idaho's voice flowed through Paul's awareness. When your opponent fears you, then's the moment when you give the fear its own reign. Give it time to work on him. Let it become terror. The terrified man fights himself. Oh, the brutality. But Paul had been warned by Cheney. Jamie's fights with either hand, and the death of his training had taken in that trick en passant. Nice use of en passant, in passing. Jamie's fell like a limp rag, face down, gasped once and turned his face toward Paul, then lay still on the rock floor. His dead eyes stared out like beads of dark glass.
brutal. Jessica stared at her son. Paul's eyes were bright. He breathed heavily, permitting the ministrations to his body rather than helping them. Nice illustration of Paul being affected by having killed, though not for the first time. But I'm sure this one is more impactful because it was needless. It is heart-wrenching that Jessica feels the need to make the moment as bad as possible for him to make sure that Paul will derive no pleasure from it. Paul glanced at his mother, back to Stolgar. Bits and pieces of this moment registered on his prescient memory, but he felt the differences as though they were physical, a pressure forcing him through the narrow door of the present. Despite Paul having this prescient vision, he so often gets no help on how to deal with the immediate situation. It's very good. Chapter 34 Paul impresses everyone at the funeral of Jamis by crying for his loss. He receives Jamis' water valued in coins and accidentally flirts with Jamie. Jessica and Paul first sees one of the thousand of caches of water the Fremen are collecting until they have enough to terraform part of the planet according to Kynes' plans. She looked out at the arachine sunset, at the banked depth of color in the sky. Night was beginning to utter its shadows along the distant rocks and the dunes. Really pretty use of beginning to utter its shadows. For no reason she could explain, and this bothered her more than the sensation, Jessica suddenly shuddered. She turned away to hide her confusion and was just in time to see the sunset. A violent calamity of color spilled over the sky as the sun dipped beneath the horizon. More parentheses, but nice use of violent calamity of color. The troop crouched down at a gesture from Stilgar, their robes hissing with the movement. Nice use of hissing. When the hawk plane stooped upon us at hole in the rock, it was James pulled me to safety. Does that sentence require a who to be correct? Comment down below. Paul felt the diminishment of his self as he advanced into the center of the circle. It was as though he lost a fragment of himself and sought it here. He bent over the mound of belongings, lifted out the ballast. A string twanged softly as it struck against something in the pile. Which is a nice view of Paul struggling with the repercussions of his actions and taking the first steps to integrate with Fremen culture. Presently, the hands withdrew. The funeral ceremony resumed, but now there was a subtle space around Paul, a drawing back as the troop honored him by respectful isolation, which is the first traces of the tragic reverence for Paul. I missed something there, Paul thought. He sensed the feeling of humor around him, something bantering in it, and his mind linked up to a prescient memory. Water counters offered to a woman, courtship ritual. I'm guessing this isn't akin to prostitution. Rather, that it's cultural for women to be in charge of the household finances. Jessica, pulled into the end of the troop by eager hands, hemmed around by jostling bodies, suppressed a moment of panic. She had recognized fragments of the ritual, identified the shards of Shakovska and Botani Jib in the words, and she knew the wild violence that could explode out of these seemingly simple moments. Jessica is continually impressive, both in schooling and abilities. It was like a child's game that had lost all inhibition in adult hands. This made me think of seeing a quote, something like, the games of children are not really games. I can't remember where it's from. Comment down below if you have an idea. <laughs> Jessica sensed mounting tension in the people around her, a pressure of silence that rasped her nerves with its urgency. Nice use of rasped. Paul felt Janie's hand on his arm, heard a faint dripping sound in the chill air, felt an utter stillness come over the Fremen in the cathedral presence of water. Nice use of cathedral, and interesting that water inspires it for the Fremen. I have seen this place in a dream, he thought. The thought was both reassuring and frustrating. Somewhere ahead of him on this path, the fanatic hordes cut the gory path across the universe in his name. The green and black Atreides banner would become a symbol of terror. 
Wild legions would charge into battle screaming their war cry, Muadib. Yeah, knowing the future would suck if all responsibility for stopping a universe-wide war lies on you. But he could feel the demanding race consciousness within him, his own terrible purpose, and he knew that no small thing could deflect the juggernaut. It was gathering weight and momentum. If he died this instant, the thing would go on through his mother and his unborn sister. Nothing less than the death of all the troop gathered here and now, himself and his mother included, could stop the thing. Like I said. A splashing sounded on her left. She looked down the shadowy line of Fremen, saw Stilgar with Paul standing beside him, and the watermasters emptying their load into the pool through a flow meter. Nice use of flow meter. Superb accuracy in water measurement, Jessica thought, and she noted that the walls of the meter trough held no trace of moisture after the water's passage. The water flowed off those walls without binding tension. She saw a profound clue to Fremen technology in the simple fact they were perfectionist. There is a lot about the importance of water in this book, but I find it interesting that Fremen has tied their currency to water rather than to spice. The dripping of water precipitated from the wind trap filled the room with its presence. Jessica saw that the entire troop was caught up in a rapture of listening. Nice use of rapture of listening. To Paul, the sound was like moments ticking away. He could feel time flowing through him, the instants never to be recaptured. He sensed a need for decision, but felt powerless to move. This was a dream to capture men's souls, and she could sense the hand of the ecologist in it. This was a dream for which men would die willingly. It was another of the essential ingredients that she felt her son needed, people with a goal. Such people would be easy to imbue with fervor and fanaticism. They could be wielded like a sword to win back Paul's place for him. I thought... But this was a subtle way to illustrate that while Paul and Jessica see the same potential in the Fremen, they have different feelings about that. And that thought lasted for about two pages. And uh, Jessica's focus is also shown in her suspicions about Cheney. And Paul, walking behind Cheney, felt that a vital moment had passed him, that he had missed an essential decision and was now caught up in his own myth. He knew he had seen this place before, experienced it in a fragment of prescient dream on faraway Caladan, but details of the place were being filled in now that he had not seen. He felt a new sense of wonder at the limits of his gift. It was as though he rode within the wave of time, sometimes in its trough, sometimes on a crest, and all around him the other waves lifted and fell, revealing and then hiding what they bore on their surface. I am so invested. Curious to know what the decision was. What could Paul have done to avoid becoming what he does? And Jessica heard the after stillness that hummed in the air with the last note. Why does my son sing a love song to that girl child, she asked herself. She felt an abrupt fear. She could sense life flowing around her and she had no grasp on its reins. Why did he choose that song, she wondered. The instincts are true sometimes. Why did he do this? And this is where the subtlety I felt two pages ago are lost. Paul sat silently in the darkness, a single stark thought dominating his awareness. My mother is my enemy. She does not know it, but she is. She is bringing the jihad. She bore me. She trained me. She is my enemy. Now, I wouldn't mind this if it included some of his thoughts on the matter his feelings about his mother's skewed priorities. I think that her affection for Leto makes her hyper-focused on Paul's ducal inheritance. But there's nothing more here. The chapter ends, and the insight doesn't mean much for the rest of the book. He still relies on her judgment at key parts of the story. I guess she might turn out to be his actual enemy in another book. But in this one, her priorities are simply different, and they're not about—they're not explicitly about causing a huge war. 
She just wants Paul to be Duke Atreides. Chapter 35 In which the Harkonnens are reinforced as evil because they don't care for their people. And Fade, as opposed to Paul, has killed a hundred people in ritual combat, relishing that glory that Jessica feared Paul would fall into. So much so that his birthday is celebrated by a match in the arena. And he is a filthy, dirty cheater. Of course he is. And I'm slightly confused by Count Fenring's portrayal in this chapter. He is supposed to be the only real friend of the Emperor, but he speaks with his wife as though he is part of the Bene Gesserit agenda, when it seems to me in, the, in Irulan's little introductions that the Emperor tolerates the Bene, Bene Gesserit because they keep him in power. Like, he is really bitter about them restricting him from having a son. The Bene Gesserit agenda includes Lady Fenring becoming pregnant with Fade's daughter for the breeding program. Of course it does. I'm also a hint confused that the Baron doesn't know that Seleucia Secundus produced the Sardaukar because Leto tells Paul in their first scene together. But this mistake is a prominent plot point. When Vladimir suggests to Fenring that he might enlist workers for Arrakis by using it as his prison planet. I guess it tells us that though Hawat has devised a show of the jewel to make Vladimir execute his slave master in favor of one loyal to Fade, Hawat isn't loyal to the Harkonnens. Or he would have let them in on his suspicions that the Emperor's prison planet is the source of his unbeatable soldiers. In honor of the Na Baron's nativity, and to remind all Harkonnens and subjects that Fade Rautha was heir designate, it was a holiday on Gedi Prime. The old Baron had decreed a meridian to meridian rest from labors, and efforts had been spent in the family city of Harko to create the illusion of gaiety. Banners flew from the buildings, new paint had been splashed on the walls along Courtway. I do really like the Na Baron title invention. But off the main way, Count Fenring and his lady noted the rubbish heaps, the scabrous brown walls reflected in the dark puddles of the streets, and the furtive scurrying of the people. Nice use of scabrous brown walls. In the Baron's blue walled keep, there was fearful perfection, but the Count and his lady saw the prize being paid guards everywhere, and weapons with that special sheen that told the trained eye they were in regular use. Nice use of fearful perfection. You are too kind, the baron said. He bowed, but Fade Rautha noted that his uncle's eyes did not agree with the courtesy. Nice use of agree. By the Oris of the Imperial Harem, she's a lovely one. Nice use of Oris. The definition being one one of the beautiful maidens that in Muslim belief live with the blessed in paradise, or two, a voluptuously beautiful young woman. There is a cone of silence between two of the pillars over here to our left, the baron said. I had only known of the cone of silence as being a comedic device, but actually it was invented by, by Arthur C. Clarke some years prior. But I still find it very humorous to see it used sincerely. And he thought, let him bring a false accusation against me and have it exposed. I shall stand there, Promethean, saying, behold me, I am wronged. Then let him bring any other accusation against me, even a true one. The great houses will not believe a second attack from an accuser once proved wrong. I really like Greek mythology, so I feel that the reason for the use of Promethean should be obvious to me. But it isn't. Maybe it's a reference to how Prometheus suffered because he was brave enough to steal fire from mankind. It doesn't match with the most common meaning of Promethean, meaning like daringly original or inventive. So I, I don't know. What do you think? Comment down below. The Count emitted a short barking laugh. Nice use of emitted. The Count stared at him with glittering intensity. Nice use of glittering intensity. The Emperor cannot believe I threaten him. 
The Baron permitted anger and grief to edge his voice, thinking, let him wrong me in that. I could place myself on the throne while still beating my breast over how I'd been wronged. Nice use of permitted. Mankind has uh, only one mm, scion, the Count said as they picked up their parade of followers and emerged from the hall into the waiting room. A narrow space with high windows and floor of patterned white and purple tile. Nice use of parade though I did find the Count's speech pattern quite annoying to read. The house's miner behind them, sheep-faced and responsive, laughed with just the right tone of appreciation, but the sound carried a note of discord as it collided with the sudden blast of motors that came to them when pages threw open the outer doors, revealing the line of ground cars, their guide and pennants whipping in the breeze. A long sentence included for me to show appreciation for the word guide on the greeting cheer lifted from the family galleries and fade rautha paused to accept it looking up and scanning the faces seeing his cousins and cousins the demi brothers the concubines and the out relations i really like the evolution of the word cousin with the feminine e at the end the aficionados would be whispering among themselves now. See how he stands. He should be agitated, attacking or retreating. See how he conserves his strength. How he waits. He should not wait. Nice use of aficionado to hammer home the likeness to bullfighting. I wonder if we're supposed to think favorably of the Atreides here. Leto's father died fighting a bull. And technically... That's not fighting a drugged-up slave, but the brutality is still in your face. Now Fade Rautha had a clear view of the gladiator's eyes, saw the cold ferocity of despair in them. Nice use of cold ferocity of despair. A concerted gasp lifted from the galleries. Nice use of concerted. Fade Rautha stood in silence, watching the slowed motions of the slave. The man moved with a hesitation awareness. There was an orthographic thing on his face now for every watcher to recognize. The death was written there. The slave knew it had been done to him, and he knew how it had been done. I'm a hint confused by orthographic here. It seems a bit literal. Pardon the pun. Fade Rautha drew back to give death its space. Yeah, like he actually has respect for it. He doesn't. The slave staggered forward as though drawn by a string, bone dragging step at a time. Each step was the only step in his universe, which is so sad. Herbert has a very nice poetic touch to his writing. I'm impressed. Yes, my lord. The man bowed himself back three paces. Nice use of bowed. Hypnolegation of that fade Rautha psyche and his child in my room, then we go. The Bene Gesserit are scary. Would that we could have saved both the Atreides youth and this one. From what I heard of the young Paul, a most admirable lad, good union of breeding and training, he shook his head. But we shouldn't waste sorrow over the aristocracy of misfortune. <laughs> nice use of aristocracy of misfortune. Chapter 36 in which Paul is presented with James's widow, Hera, and their children, which must be a sucky consequence for Jeff defending himself. Hera is upset that Paul chooses to take her as a servant rather than a wife. I assume that she wants to preserve the life of her children and herself and not become homeless because Paul doesn't want a servant anymore. Shani learns that her father is dead, a quality she shares with Paul, and Paul learns from Hera that they are preparing to leave the siege, fleeing from the Sardaukar. Wind raked dead leaves strewed the cliff base where the siege children had been gathering them, but the sounds of the troops' passage, except for occasional blunderings by Paul and his mother, could not be distinguished from the nocturnal sounds of the night. Nice use of wind raked leaves. Also, blunderings. Paul White, sweat caked dust from his forehead, felt a tug at his arm, heard Cheney's voice hissing. 
do as i told you bring the fold of your hood down over your forehead leave only the eyes exposed you waste moisture nice use of sweat caked dust throw off your hood also farok said you're home and he helped paul releasing the hood catch elbowing a space around them nice detail of hood catch and nice use of elbowing paul slipped out his nose plugs swung his mouth baffle aside the odor of the place assailed him unwashed bodies distillate esters of reclaimed wastes everywhere the sour effluvia of humanity with over it all a turbulence of spice and spice-like harmonics very colorful visceral description i'll mourn james in the proper time for it she said as though her mind had not left his other question it is nice that though hera doesn't cry for james because fremen have taught themselves not to cry because that's a waste of moisture hera is still distressed by James's loss, and not only because it changes her situation. People in the openings fell silent at their approach, followed Paul with untamed stares. Nice use of untamed stares. Paul hesitated before joining her on the ledge. He felt a sudden reluctance to be alone with this woman. It came to him that he was surrounded by a way of life that could only be understood by postulating an ecology of ideas and values. He felt that this Fremen world was fishing for him, trying to snare him in its ways. And he knew what lay in that snare. The wild jihad, religious war he felt he should avoid at any cost. Yeah, being alone in the home of someone of a foreign culture would be intense under these circumstances. In particular, because everyone acts like he should automatically plug into the cultural practices. She smiled at him. A knowing woman's smile that he found disquieting. Hera has been referring to him as a child, so it, it's a hint unfortunate that she has just complimented him physically. And it's also very cute that he's infatuated with Jamie. He heard a rustle of hangings, thought it was Hera returning with food, and turned to watch her. Instead, from beneath a displaced patterns of hangings, he saw two young boys, perhaps aged nine and ten, staring out at him with greedy eyes. Each wore a small kinjal tight crisp knife, rested a hand on the hilt. And Paul recalled the stories of the Fremen, that their children fought as ferociously as the adult. Which is a brilliant way to end a chapter. It's a fantastic cliffhanger, though it is very soon shown that there was never any danger. So great though. Chapter 37, in which Jessica drinks the unchanged water of life and becomes the reverend mother of the Fremen, and her unborn daughter is simultaneously exposed to the cumulative lifetimes of the great many predecessors along with Jessica. The water of life is the death effluvia from a drowned sandworm. It is the ritual responsibility of the Fremen reverend mother to change this poison to be drinkable in various ceremonies. We also learn that Paul's future knowledge can be temporarily shared with those in proximity while under the influence of the changed water of life, which is the reason that he later avoids participating in these ceremonies because he wants to keep the potential jihad a secret from the people, which is, I, I don't know what I think about that. Let's move on. Phosphor tubes in the faraway upper reaches of the cavern cast a dim light onto the thronged interior, hinting at the great size of this rock-enclosed space. Larger, Jessica saw, than even the gathering hall of her Bene Gesserit school. She estimated there were more than 5,000 people gathered out there beneath the ledge where she stood with Stilgar, and more were coming. Cool. The air was murmurous with people. Nice use of murmurous. Out in the desert, she knew, it was already red nightfall, but here in the cavern hall was perpetual twilight, a grey vastness thronged with people come to see her risk her life. Nice use of grey vastness. It was one of the customs the two sons of Jamis had explained to him by indirection, telling him they wore no green because they accepted him as guardian father. Nice use of indirection. 
It had been a strange day, with these two standing guard over him because he asked it, keeping away the curious, allowing him the time to nurse his thoughts and prescient memories to plan a way to prevent the jihad. Nice use of nurse his thoughts, I think, as in the way you nurse a wound. Now, standing beside his mother on the cavern ledge and looking out at the throng, he wondered if any plan could prevent the wild outpouring of fanatic legions. The Reverend Mother tells me she cannot survive another Hira, Stilgar said. There are many evolved words in the Fremen tongue, or simply foreign ones, which I couldn't find. Hira reminds me of the word Hajira, which means a mass exodus or prosecution. And they do have to abandon the siege because they're fleeing from the Sardaukar pogrom. So that would fit very well in my opinion. Though I don't think it's really sufficiently explained why the Sardaukar want to wipe out the Fremen for being worthy opponents. Maybe it is because their identity depends on being unbeatable. I'm guessing that the Sardaukar pogrom is meant to show a kind of preamble to the jihad that Paul is trying to prevent. Like, fanatical soldiers will drive a war irregardless of... Just kidding. Um, regardless of the will of their leader. Now, the throng stirred, rippling with whispers and currents of disquiet. Nice use of currents of disquiet. She saw Paul staring at her, his eyes filled with questions, but his mouth held silent but all the strangeness around them. It is notable to me that while Paul predicted the life of his sister, he didn't see how she was created. I consecrate the daughter of Liette in the Sayadina, husked the old woman. Nice use of husked. She looked as though a breeze would blow her away. Yet there was that about her which suggested she might stand untouched in the path of a Coriolis storm. Checking the definition of Coriolis did not help me picture the storm, but it sounds brutal. Jessica, feeling the ceremony close around her with a current that swept her beyond all turning back, glanced once at Paul's question-filled face, then prepared herself for the ordeal. Nice. A fairy redolence of cinnamon arose from the sack, wafted across Jessica. Nice use of fairy redolence. Now Jessica felt the sense of danger boiling around her. She glanced at Paul, saw that he was caught up in the mystery of the ritual, and had eyes only for Shaney. Nice use of boiling, and a very telling description of the ceremony. To accept a little death is worse than death itself, Cheney said. She stared at Jessica, waiting. I like this mention of Little Death because it harks back to the Bene Gesserit litany against fear. This culture is imbued with Bene Gesserit beliefs. Whirling silence settled around Jessica. Every fiber of her body accepted the fact that something profound had happened to it. She felt that she was a conscious moat, smaller than any subatomic particle, yet capable of motion in sensing her surroundings. Like an abrupt revelation, the curtains whipped away. She realized she had become aware of a psychokinesthetic extension of herself. She was the moat, yet not the moat. Nice use of psychokinesthetic. Psycho meaning soul or mind, and kinesthetic meaning relating to bodily reaction or motor memory. She found it within the drug she had swallowed. The stuff was dancing particles within her, its motions so rapid that even frozen time could not stop them. Dancing particles. She began recognizing familiar structures, atomic linkages, a carbon atom here, helical wavering, a glucose molecule. An entire chain of molecules confronted her and she recognized a protein, a methyl protein configuration. I appreciate the sciency feel to this part. But Jessica saw that the Reverend Mother did not think of herself as old. An image unfolded before the mutual mind's eye. A young girl with a dancing spirit and tender humor. Nice use of dancing spirit. And she knew, with a generalized awareness, that she had become, in truth, precisely what was meant by a Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother. The poison drug had transformed her. And Jessica does continue to be primarily Bene Gesserit.
and the memory mind encapsulated within her opened itself to Jessica, permitting a view down a wide corridor to other reverend mothers until there seemed no end to them. Very nice to put it into words that I do understand. Jessica recoiled, fearing she would become lost in an ocean of oneness. Still, the corridor remained, revealing to Jessica that the Fremen culture was far older than she had suspected. Jessica saw the slave cribs on Bella Tegu's down that inner corridor, saw the weeding out and the selecting that spread men to Rossack and Harmontheth. Scenes of brutal ferocity opened to her like the petals of a terrible flower and she saw the thread of the past carried by Sayadina after Sayadina, first by word of mouth, hidden in the sand shanties, then refined through their own reverend mothers with the discovery of the poison drug on Rossack, and now developed to subtle strength on Arrakis in the discovery of the water of life. Nice use of terrible flower and sand shanties. I'm also fascinated by the long tradition of using poisons to alter the mind state of practitioners. Paul's voice intruded on her and Jessica struggled out of the inner awareness to stare up at him, conscious of duty to him, but resenting his presence. And yet Paul leaves her alone as she chooses to become high and revel in her newfound awareness. He searched his memory, the fixed past, the flux lines of possible futures. It was like scanning through the arrested instance of time, disconcerting to the lens of the inner eye. The fragments were difficult to understand when snatched out of the flux. Nice description of the differences between the present and the future. To Paul. Things persisted in not being what they seemed. Nice use of persisted. He felt carnival excitement in the air. He knew what would happen if he drank this spice drug with its quintessence of the substance that brought the change onto him. He would return to the vision of pure time, of time become space. It would perch him on the dizzying summit and defy him to understand. Nice use of carnival excitement and nice description of how small Paul is in the face of destiny. On one side he could see the Imperium. A Harkonnen called Fade Rausa, who flashed toward him like a deadly blade, the Sardaukar raging off their planet to spread pogrom on Arrakis, the guild conniving and plotting, the Bene Gesserit with their scheme of selective reading, they lay massed like a thunderhead on his horizon, held back by no more than the Fremen and their Muad'Dib, the sleeping giant Fremen poised for their wild crusade across the universe. Nice way to show that the terrible purpose Paul experiences is a measure against all of the bad things already happening. Only the Fremen, in the name of a legendary leader, are strong enough to stand against all of that. Book 3. The Prophet. And we're... I, well, it would be optimistic to say that we're almost there, but we're making progress. I'm, I keep saying, you know, my face and, you know, the, the makeup says it's, the makeup says it was supposed to be long lasting, but you know, I don't think so, but we'll keep going anyway, and we'll get there eventually. Here we go. Chapter 38. Almost two years later, and we see the continued in-scheming in House Harkonnen. The Baron is in a rage because Fade has attempted to kill him by implanting a poison needle into a slave the Baron would have taken advantage of, and his guard captain didn't check him properly. Vladimir only survived it because Hawat had warned him. We also learn that Fade never had a chance to become a decent person. In response for trying to kill Vladimir, he is punished by being forced to himself kill all of the pleasure slaves in the slave wing, with whom Vladimir seems to believe he is spending too much time being quite the hypocrite, yes. I assume that Hawat is working to encourage Vladimir and Fade to act against each other. Neither of the Harkonnen are willing to admit the, to the other that they rely on Hawat for help. The Baron scanned the faces around him seeing the looks of frantic quiet in them. Nice use of frantic quiet. The Baron advanced another step into the antechamber, noting how the men moved back, clearing a subtle space around Nifud. 
dissociating themselves from the object of wrath. Nice use of dissociating. Would you accompany me to my chambers, Fade? the baron asked. I'm yours to command, Fade, Rautha said. He bowed, thinking, I'm caught. Nice summary there. The baron shook his head, thinking, it would have worked too if Hawat hadn't warned me. Well, let the lad believe I saw the plot on my own. In a way, I did. I was the one who saved Hawat from the wreckage of a racket. Yes, the baron is a small, small man. Only a flicker of eyelids betrayed the passage of resentment through Fade Rautha. I'm not gonna say that Fade is the better Harkonnen, but he has self-control, at least. Chapter 39 Hawat, with great hostility, elucidates the Baron about Seleucus Secundus and how Vladimir made a mistake suggesting to use Arrakis as a prison planet to one of the Emperor's friends. Hawat says Count Fenring obviously took it as a threat against the Emperor. As a result, Hawat advises the Baron to distance himself from Raban, withdrawing further aid in the struggle against the Fremen, which isn't going too well. Yes, well, I wish to know how Arrakis figures in your suspicions about Seleucia Secundus. It is not enough that you say to me the Emperor is in a ferment about some association between Arrakis and his mysterious prison planet. Nice use of ferment. The Padishah Emperor turned against House Atreides because the Duke's war masters, Gurney Halleck and Duncan Idaho, had trained a fighting force, a small fighting force, to within a hair as good as the Sardaukar. I wonder if this theory of Hawat is actually true. It would mean that all the talk about the Shom company being the governing force would be untrue. It's a hint petty, you know. Or is it when the Fremen is the source of Paul's power? I don't know. I, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking about it. The recruits come to believe in time that such a place as Seleucia Secundus is justified because it produced them, the elite. The communist Sardaukar trooper lives a life, in many respects, as exalted as that of any member of a great house. This makes me really curious about how the Sardaukar feature in the following books. It has been curious that they were so intent on wiping out the Fremen. Is it them? Or is it the Emperor seeing a threat to his horses? Ah yes, where did House Carino originate? Were there people on Seleucia Secundus before the Emperor sent his first contingent of prisoners there? Even the Duke Leto, a cousin on the distaff side, never knew for sure. Such questions are not encouraged. Nice use of distaff. I had only known of that word to mean a spinning device, but it also means on the mother's side. Slowly, the Baron composed his features. When the time comes, he thought, I'll remember his manner with me. Yes, I will remember. In case we needed further reminders that the Baron is a tiny little person. Would you prefer to have the Emperor and those great houses he can still swing behind him come in here and perform a correctment, scrape out Gieti Prime like a hollow gourd? Nice use of correctment, new word for me. The scraping of a bodily cavity by means of a curette to clean its surface, to obtain material for diagnostic purposes or to remove lesion or foreign body. Nice. Demand your baronial profits, but be careful how you make your demand. Nice use of baronial profits. Chapter 40. There hovers a question, just how much time has passed since the end of the last part. It was two years in the last chapters, but it turns out to be more than that here. Paul is actually about to become a full-fledged Fremen by mounting a sandworm on his own. Once he does it, he is expected to call out and kill Stilgar for leadership of the siege, which is a problem. There is already a problem with all of the men coming to challenge Paul as it is, enough that Cheney has felt the need to step in. Besides that, Cheney and Paul are adorable together. They've had a little period of peace, had a child together. Leto II. Paul has also organized the Fedaikin, 
an elite group of death commandos. How sweet. There is also issues regarding Paul's little sister, Alia, and her receiving all of the memories of the old reverend mothers along with Jessica. Paul Maudib remembered that there had been a meal heavy with spice essence. He clung to this memory because it was an anchor point, and he could tell himself from this vantage that his immediate experience must be a dream. This is a creative way to orient us in the turn of events, but it's not very precise. <laughs> Yet, he could not escape the fear that he had somehow overrun himself, lost his position in time, so that past and future and present mingled without distinction. It was a kind of visual fatigue, and it came, he knew, from the constant necessity of holding the prescient future as a kind of memory that was itself a thing intrinsically of the past. I felt smart because this description fit neatly into my understanding of Paul's powers. Small pleasures, you know. Paul glared at her, caught by the odd ferocity beneath her casual attitude. Nice use of odd ferocity. Paul is being challenged with increasing frequency by men challenging his place in the myth, I think, since he doesn't have any official leadership to be challenged yet. Jamie took care of one of the challengers to discourage unworthy challengers throwing away their lives trying to defeat Paul. I dream, Paul reassured himself. It's the spice meal. Still, there was about him a feeling of abandonment. He wondered if it might be possible that his rude spirit had slipped over somehow into the world where the Fremen believed he had his true existence, into the Alam al Mital. The world of similitudes, that metaphysical realm where all physical limitations were removed. And he knew fear at the thought of such a place, because removal of all limitations meant removal of all points of reference. In the landscape of a myth, he could not orient himself and say, I am because I am here. This is a very interesting piece of Fremen lore, which seems to have a Muslim origin. Well, lots of Fremen myth seems to have a Muslim origin. Jessica was fearful of the religious relationship between himself and the Fremen, Paul knew. She didn't like the fact that people of both Sich and Graben referred to Muadib as him, and she went questioning among the tribes, sending out her Sayadina spies, collecting their answers and brooding on them. I'm a little confused by Jessica from this point on. I would like to have stated what about the religious relationship she disapproves of, because she dove headfirst into it. I'm guessing that she disapproves of Paul believing any of it, because it might hold him back from taking full advantage of the Fremen. We are in the desert, Paul remembered. We are in the central erg beyond the Harkonnen patrols. I am here to walk the sand, to lure a maker and mount him by my own cunning, that I may be a Fremen entire. Which is a nice statement of affairs. Sihaya, he said, speaking with half a laugh in his voice. Ah, such a sweet throwback to their first meeting. He thought of the power he wielded in the face of the pogrom, the old men who sent their sons to him to be trained in the weirding way of battle, the old men who listened to him now in council and followed his plans, the men who returned to him to pay him that highest Fremen compliment, your plan worked, Moadib. I like the Fremen. They seem to be a straightforward kind of people. And it's interesting that without the pogrom, there wouldn't be a need to drastically improve the Fremen's training and drive them toward Paul. Memory returned to him of his wrestling with his inner awareness during the night. He saw a strange parallel here. If he mastered the maker, his role was strengthened. If he mastered the inward eye, this carried its own measure of command. But beyond them both lay the clouded area, the great unrest where all the universe seemed embroiled. First, nice semicolon usage. I also like that Herbert is selective with his capitalizations. The difference in the ways he comprehended the universe haunted him. Accuracy matched with inaccuracy. He saw it in situ. Yet when it was born, when it came into the pressures of reality, the now had its own life and grew with its own subtle differences. Terrible purpose remained. Race consciousness remained. 
and over all loom the jihad bloody and wild i inappropriately kept thinking about nick cage here for her lips were the color of the roses that grow down the river all bloody and wild inappropriate also i like in situ here the meaning is obvious even though it actually means in the natural or original position there is yet misunderstanding because of alia's strangeness the women are fearful because a child looking more than an infant talks of things that only an adult should know they do not understand the change in the womb that made alia different there is trouble he asked and he thought i've seen visions of trouble over alia i'm impressed that paul isn't constantly immobilized by fear over all the worst case scenarios he has witnessed cheney looked toward the growing line of the sunrise some of the women banded to appeal to the reverend mother they demanded she exercise the demon in her daughter they quoted the scripture suffer not a witch to live among us and it's sad that that part remained in scripture the imperfect vision plagued him the more he resisted his terrible purpose and fought against the coming of the jihad the greater the turmoil that wove through his prescience his entire future was becoming like a river hurtling toward a chasm the violent nexus beyond which all was fog and clouds time has passed but the same problem remains Sildar moved toward him across the flower sand stirring up little dust puddles i appreciate the different descriptions of various kinds of sand in the book because it makes sense the dark niches of his eyes remained steady on paul with their untamed stare nice use of dark niches and untamed stare and he thought of how the fremen were a people whose living consisted of killing an entire people who had lived with rage and grief all their days never once considering what might take the place of either except for a dream with which liet kynes had infused them before his death nice use of infused and yeah this is the emperor's and the harkonnen's fault i'm right amazing paul marked the tone of stilgar's voice half ritual and half that of a worried friend their relationship is wonderfully built up right for knocking you over before long with the whip-like hook staffs paul knew he could mount the maker's high curving back for as long as the forward edge of a worm's ring segment was held open by a hook open to admit abrasive sand into the more sensitive interior the creature would not retreat beneath the desert it would in fact roll its gigantic body to bring the open segment as far away from the desert surface as possible i appreciate the explanation it never made sense to me before once he was past this test he paul knew he was qualified to make the twenty thumper journey into the southland to rest and restore himself into the south where the women and the families had been hidden from the pogrom among the new palmeries and siege warrens every time they talk about the south you invariably think about how the fremen are bribing the spacing guild not to watch the surface of arrakis and how precarious it is to rely on that with abrupt decision paul released the thumper's latch nice use of abrupt decision it came from the southeast a distant hissing a sand whisper nice use of sand whisper chapter 41 jessica has to face the mistreatments of alia and hera plays a crucial role she is apparently a nice person remaining in paul's service not only because it gives her son's status but because she genuinely cares she has even made nice with stilgar's wives anticipating that they would become one family once paul is soon forced to kill him for leadership a faint tinkling drumming slapping penetrated to the resting chamber nice use of tinkling dash drumming dash slapping there was nothing of telepathy here she knew it was the tau the oneness of the siege community a compensation from the subtle poison of the spice diet they shared the great mass of the people could never hope to attain the enlightenment the spice seed brought to her they had not been trained and prepared for it their minds rejected what they could not understand or encompass still they felt and reacted sometimes like a single organism cool 
everybody is a little bit high and vibing together. Nice. More than two years we've been here, she thought, and twice that number at least to go before we can even hope to think of trying to wrest a rackets from the hearkening governor, the Mudir Naya, the beast Raban. It is not stated what Paul's plan is, but considering the disconnect between him and Jessica, I wonder if they imagine the same agenda or even time frame. The voice from outside the hangings at her door was that of Hera, the other woman in Paul's menage. Interesting use of menage. But I have recently learned that the menage in menage a trois actually means household. It was when I looked up manege for a story I'm writing, and then as in a horse riding arena. That's a fun word to say. Manege, 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 manege. Manage. Jessica marked the term Alia used to refer to Hera, Ganima. In the subtleties of the Fremen tongue, the word meant something acquired in battle, and with the added overtone that the something no longer was used for its original purpose, an ornament a spear had used as a curtain weight. I love specialized words, if that isn't obvious by now. I will tell them the truth, Hera said. Her face seemed suddenly old and sad, with its olive skin drawn into frown wrinkles, a witchery in the sharp features. I will tell them that Alia only pretends to be a little girl, that she has never been a little girl. Nice use of witchery, I guess with the meaning, an irresistible fascination. Hera rubbed her eyes, smiled reassuringly at Alia. Yet there was a look of wildness in the eyes of the Fremen woman, an intensity as though they too were trying to hear Alia's words. It is a hint strange to talk about eyes attempting to hear, but I get the point. Gathering water, planting the dunes, changing their world slowly but surely, these are no longer enough, Jessica thought. The little raids, the certain raids, these are no longer enough now that Paul and I have trained them. They feel their power. They want to fight. Which is the part of all this which Paul and Jessica are responsible for? She doesn't express remorse for being responsible for it, though. She's just concerned that the Fremen will want a bigger fight before Jessica believes is the optimal time. Chapter 42 None too surprisingly, Paul manages to hook the worm, albeit imperfectly, and there is a really interesting scene with him and Stilgar showing their mentor-mentee relationship despite Paul being seen as him. The ride is cut short, however, because they spot a group of softers approaching. Now the thumpers' deep drumming blended with the hiss of the approaching worm. Paul breathed deeply, smelling mineral bitterness of sand even through his filters. The wild maker, the old man of the desert, loomed almost on him. Its cresting front segments threw a sand wave that would sweep across his knees. Nice use of mineral bitterness. And I also really like that big wild worms are called old men of the desert. In spite of a surge of anger, Paul knew that Stilgar spoke the truth. It took a long minute and the full effort of the training he had received from his mother for Paul to recapture a feeling of calm. I apologize, he said. It will not happen again. I like both Stilgar admonishing Paul for his imperfect form, but also seeing that Paul is human enough to be provoked by being criticized when he has accomplished something of this importance. Also, that he makes the effort not to be nasty to his friend. Stilgar studied him as they rode, and Paul realized the man was seeing this moment through the memory of how he had risen to command the Tabar siege and the leadership of the Council of Leaders now that Liet Kynes was dead. Yes, Stilgar knows exactly what will predictably happen now that Paul has the status to challenge him. Does my decision suit Moadib? Stilgar asked. Only the faintest touch of sarcasm tinged his voice, but Fremen ears around them, alert to every tone in a bird's cry or a Siolago's piping message, heard the sarcasm and watched Paul to see what to do. Yeah, be curious, listen to interesting conversations around, especially sarcastic ones. 
Stilgar heard me swear my loyalty to him when we consecrated the Fedaika in Palsad. My death commandos know I spoke with honor. Does Stilgar doubt it? Real pain exposed itself in Paul's voice. Stilgar heard it and lowered his gaze. See, they care for each other. How sweet. Paul saw that Stilgar was too immersed in the Fremen way to consider the possibility of any other. Here a leader took the reins from the dead hands of his predecessors, or slew among the strongest of his tribe if a leader died in the desert. Stilgar had risen to be a naive that way. It is a genuinely sad situation, if I hadn't already known that it doesn't happen. Freed of its goads and hooks, the big worm began burrowing into the sand. Paul ran lightly back along its broad surface, judged his moment carefully, and leaped off. He landed running, lunged against the slip face of a dune the way he had been taught, and hid himself beneath the cascade of sand over his robe. Cool. Chapter 43 In which Gurney Halleck returns to the picture. He has been among smugglers all this time, and obviously rose to leadership. Unbeknownst to him, his group has been infiltrated by Sardaukar, who is on a mission to find and kill the mysterious religious leader of the Fremen. Stilgar accepts that it would be foolish of them to fight over leadership of his siege, but it's the public masses that will need convincing, especially overexcited young men. The smuggler's spice factory, with its parent carrier and ring of drone ornithopters, came over a lifting of dunes like a swarm of insects following its queen. Nice simile. It annoyed Gurney, the cunning and adroitness in battle of these natives. They displayed a sophistication in warfare as good as anything he had ever encountered, and he had been trained by the best fighters in the universe, then seasoned in battles where only the superior few survived. It's nice to see why Paul would be an asset to Fremen strategy meetings. He was trained by Gurney after all. But I was also I would like to see another comma in this sentence. Again Gurney scanned the horizon. He had to respect the possibility that there were Fremen here and he was trespassing. Fremen worried him, their toughness and unpredictability. So he's smarter than all of the Harkonnen in this book. A thopter swooped down nearby, skidded to a stop. Another followed, and another. They disgorged Gurney's platoon and lifted to hoverflight. Nice use of disgorged and hoverflight. Gurney had time to think. By the horns of the great mother, rocket. They dare to use rockets. Implications are always fun. Being interested in mythology, I do wonder if there is a great mother with horns, or if it's an invention. If they dared use rockets, they'd have other projectile weapons. This moment argued extreme caution. Nice use of argued. A smile touched Paul's mouth, but there was a hardness in the expression that reminded Gurney of the old duke, Paul's grandfather. Gurney saw then the sinewy harshness in Paul that had never before been seen in an Atreides. A leathery look to the skin, a squint to the eyes, and calculation in the glance that seemed to weigh everything in sight. This hits me harder in the second read when I put together what happens soon and Jessica's earlier exposition about the old duke being responsible for everything hateful in Leto. See, you should always read a good book at least twice. Gurney realized that was all the apology he'd ever get for having been abandoned to his own resources. Left to believe his young duke, his friend, was dead. He wondered then if there were anything left here of the boy he had known and trained in the ways of fighting men. Yeah, it was very calculating of them just to leave Gurney because Paul knew he was alive. But you also understand why he did it. So it's not very nice. It seemed to happen of itself and they were embracing, pounding each other on the back, feeling the reassurance of solid flesh. Ah. Little enough profit in our venture, Paul said, and he noted the subtle finger signal flashed to him by Gurney's right hand, the old hand code out of the past. There were men to fear and distrust in the smuggler crew. Having so many codes for communication is telling. I'm going with telling. Paul stared at the dark visage above him, wondering at the reasons which had impelled Stilgar to say just that, his duke. 
There had been a strange, subtle intonation in Stelgar's voice, as though he would rather have said something else. And that wasn't like Stelgar, who was the leader of Fremen, a man who spoke his mind. Everyone likes a bit of sarcasm now and again, and Stelgar still believes he is about to die, because he cannot deprive the Fremen people of their Lisan al Gaib. Again, Gurney looked at the spice blue in Paul's eyes. His own eyes, he knew, had a touch of the color. But smugglers could get off-world foods, and there was a subtle case implication in the tone of the eyes among them. They spoke of the touch of the spice brush to mean a man had gone too native, and there was always a hint of distrust in the idea. Yeah, finding reasons to feel more than is important too, I guess. Beneath them on the floor of the cave swirled a melee of struggling figures. Nice use of swirled. Anger and confusion were betrayed in his manner. But still there was that pride about him, without which a Sardaukar appeared undressed, and with which he could appear fully clothed, though naked. Throughout the book, since the beginning when Leto raises the comparison, I wonder what I'm supposed to draw from the descriptions of the Sardaukar. Am I supposed to see likenesses to the Fremen in their description? Both of them underestimate the other, after all. Like James, the Fremen think off-worlders are soft with excessive water and the Sardaukar are convinced of their own specialness. I wonder. A tense air came over the Fedaikin. They did not like him thus exposed to danger. This was the thing they were pledged to prevent because the Fremen wished to preserve the wisdom of Muad'Dib. This smells a little bit of the alternative storyline I described in the intro. A very long time ago, I understand if you don't remember it by now. The manner about him that had dismissed this cavern as a barbarian warren melted away. Nice use of barbarian warren. The emperor is not likely to have that power over me, Paul said. He spoke slowly, coldly. Something had happened inside him while he faced the Sardaukar. A sum of decision had accumulated in his awareness. This reminds me that Paul has been trained as a mentat, though that isn't mentioned since the training was revealed to him. A mentat requires enough information to draw a logical conclusion. Chapter 44 With the support of Jessica, Paul successfully argues to his closest and to the Fremen leadership that he need not kill Stilgar to assume leadership. He places himself outside the normal Fremen structure of government as the rightful Duke of Arrakis. And I feel a hint dubious about this argument. It sounds to me like the Fremen recognize the Emperor's ultimate power over them, and I think they would be resistant to this. To accept Paul as Duke is, in a way, to validate the Harkonnens' tyranny. I remember being underwhelmed by the speech in the miniseries as well, but there it is underscored by Paul summoning water out of nowhere, which doesn't happen in the book, thankfully. Jessica, for some damn reason, is dismayed that Paul is accepting the role of Lisan al Gaib. I would be a little less skeptical of this if it was explored in some way. Then Gurney, under the impression that Jessica was the traitor, wants to make her confess her complicity and then kill her, but Paul convinces him it's not true. Paul is horribly shaken by the event, since none of his visions warned him of the eventuality, and it prompts him to drink the unchanged water of life, which is supposedly lethal to any man but the Kwisat Hadarak. Do you see now why I'm not vibing with declaring Jessica to be his enemy. Inside, he, he only thought it, but still, it was declared to us, the reader. Because I'm skeptical because it has no relevant reason because Jessica isn't his enemy. As simple as that. The crowd in the cavern assembly chamber radiated that pack feeling Jessica had sensed the day Paul killed Janus. There was murmuring nervousness in the voices. Little cliques gathered like knots among the robes. Nice use of murmuring nervousness. Paul stood with a group of the younger men near the ledge. The pale light of the glow globes gave the scene a tinge of unreality. It was like a tableau, but with the added dimensions of warm smells, the whispers, and the sounds of shuffling feet. 
nice use of unreality. Stilgar waited with a small group of his own at the other end of the ledge. There was a feeling of inevitable dignity about him, the way he stood without talking. Nice use of inevitable dignity. The young men drew back from Paul as she came up to him, and she found herself momentarily dismayed by the new deference they paid him. All men beneath your position covet your station, went the Bene Gesserit axiom, but she found no covetousness in these faces. They were held at a distance by the religious ferment around Paul's leadership, and she recalled another Bene Gesserit saying, Prophets have a way of dying by violence. I'm probably iterating a useless point, but I am torn on Jessica's motivation for things. Bated silence came over the group, spreading out into the crowd. Nice use of baited silence. Do it, someone shrieked. Murmurs and whispers arose behind the shriek. Nice description. Repeat after me, Stilgar, Paul said, and he called up the words of investiture as he had heard his own father use them. Nice use of investiture. Remembering the source of the right, Jessica blinked back tears, shook her head. I know the reason for this, she thought. I shouldn't let it stir me. She is obviously still severely romanticizing her partnership with Lido, the man she was at times afraid of. Yeah. Paul's coffee service, the fluted alloy of silver and jasmium that he had inherited from Janus, rested on a low table to her right. The coffee service, still being a societal mark shared across the universe, I have no idea what jasmium would look like. According to Google, it's a flower, jasmine. What can his desert woman do for a duke except serve him coffee, she asked herself. She brings him no power, no family. Paul has only one major chance, to ally himself with a powerful great house, perhaps even with the imperial family. There are marriageable princesses, after all, and every one of them Bene Gesserit trained. This thought shows for me how little Jessica seems to understand Paul. And there is another contradiction for me. I would expect that Paul having a Fremen partner, partner does make a difference in the eyes of the people. And Cheney is the daughter of Liette. She's the niece of Stilgar. So yeah, she is of a powerful family. She is herself a Sayadina. Jessica doesn't like that Paul is a religious leader among the Fremen. But she also doesn't want him to use other avenues of influence with the Fremen. She knows that the Fremen people are Paul's strongest source of power. So this line of thinking illustrates how narrow-minded she is. Trying to reconcile Jessica's character takes a lot of processing for me. It was one of the main things in my reread of this story. Jessica imagined herself leaving the rigors of Arrakis for the life of power and security she could know as a mother of a royal consort. Here, I think it's quite telling that she doesn't consider that she finagled her way to the topmost religious position to save her own skin and that she now has an obligation to fill that role. Then she felt the touch of the knife tip against her back. Chill awareness spread out from that knife tip. Nice description. Here was a killer, wary of the void, wary of every combat stratagem, wary of every trick of death and violence. Here was an instrument she herself had helped train with subtle hints and suggestion. But, 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 Hawat was surprised when she used the voice on him. It seems a hint unrealistic that Gurney would have some kind of instinctual awareness of it when the Mentat didn't. Be quiet, Paul said, and the monotone stillness of his words carried more command than Jessica had ever heard in another voice. He has the great control, she thought. Nice use of monotone stillness and the first appearance of the capitalized great control. The previous descriptions of changing of tone with the voice means more when its ultimate form apparently is flat. Jessica felt herself losing control, bit at her lower lip. Seeing the stiff formality in Paul, she realized what these words were costing him. She wanted to run to him, cradle his head against her breast as she had never done. 
but the arm against her throat had ceased its trembling, the knife point at her back pressed still and sharp. She never comforted Paul that way? Ever? I'm hoping it's because Paul has never needed it, but to me it sounds like she has been distant with everything but Benny Jesser training, which is really sad. Gurney nodded. His mind seemed far away, as though he dwelled for this moment beneath the open skies of Caladan, with cloud fleece on the horizon promising rain. Nice use of cloud fleece. And rain being seen with nostalgia on Arrakis. There would be a small shy halud in this place. A creature no more than nine meters long, kept stunted and trapped by surrounding water ditches. The maker, after emerging from its little maker vector, avoided water for the poison it was. Nice use of maker vector, and I appreciate the explanation. The decision had come to Paul while he faced the tension of danger to his mother. No line of the future he had ever seen carried that moment of peril from Gurney Halleck. The future the grey cloud future, with its feeling that the entire universe rolled toward a boiling nexus hung around him like a phantom world. Nice use of grey cloud future, and phantom world like a phantom limb. His body has slowly acquired a certain spice tolerance that made prescient visions fewer and fewer, dimmer and dimmer. The solution appeared obvious to him. Paul is still quite young, but as I'm not entirely, I'm guessing about 18 here. And I wonder what will happen to him in just a few years. Chapter 45. Paul has been unconscious, seemingly dead, for three weeks. And Jessica eventually yielded to her own ignorance and summoned Cheney for help. I find it interesting that it wasn't because Cheney deserves to be there with her dying romantic partner despite Jessica having that little moment of motherly care for her son's happiness. I'm sorry, didn't mean to be too sarcastic there. But I'm just not feeling Jessica anymore. Cancel the ship. That was never going to happen because she's hung up on Leto. Shaney correctly identifies why Paul is unresponsive and revives him. Everyone then accepts that Paul is the Kwisatz Haderach, Jessica having the most bizarre reaction, and while in this trance, he gains awareness of the Emperor in orbit around Arrakis, along with the Harkonnen and most of the Great Houses. The Spacing Guild is aware that Paul has the ability to destroy all spies forever, and are panicking because in this book, it is a secret that they require it. She gathered her robe and leaped lightly up across a barrier rock and onto the climbing path that only the desert train could recognize in the darkness. Pebbles slithered underfoot and she danced across them without considering the nimbleness required. Nice use of slithered and nice to see Cheney adapt in the environment. She felt the inner leaping at the nearness of reunion with Paul Muadib, her Usul. His name might be a battle cry over all the land, Muadib, Muadib, Muadib. But she knew a different man by a different name, the father of her son, the tender lover. Ah. New victories, Jessica said. Raban has sent cautious overtures about a truce. His messengers have been returned without their water. It's such a brutal and quintessential Fremen insult. Paul, Jessica screamed. He grabbed her hand, faced her with a death's head grin, and he sent his awareness surging over her. The rapport was not as tender, not as sharing, not as encompassing as it had been with Alia and with the old reverend mother in the cavern, but it was a rapport, a sense sharing of the entire being. It shook her, weakened her, and she cowered in her mind, fearful of him. Okay. Paul's consciousness flowed through and around her and into the darkness. She glimpsed the place dimly before her mind blanked itself away from the terror. Without knowing why, her whole being trembled at what she had seen. A region where a wind blew and sparks glared, where rings of light expanded and contracted, where rows of chumescent white shapes flowed over and under and around the lights, driven by darkness and wind out of nowhere. The place where women cannot see with their 
inward eye. Okay, he has seen, Jessica whispered. Her mind still rolled and surged from the contact. It was like stepping to solid land after weeks on a heaving sea. She sensed the old reverend mother within her, and all the others awakened and questioning. What was that? What happened? Where was that place? That's interesting. Does she have direct contact with the old reverend mothers? It would make it more despicable of her to deprive the Fremen of that contact. Through it all threaded the realization that her son was the Kwisatz Haderach, the one who could be many places at once. He was the fact out of the Bene Gesserit dream, and the fact gave her no peace. Jessica has been hoping for this for the whole book, and we're not given the explanation for her disappointment. I'm frustrated about that. Accepting the words, Chini was touched by some of the prescience that haunted Paul, and she knew a thing yet to be as though it had already occurred. Othame would speak of what he had seen and heard. Others would spread the story until it was a fire over the land. Paul Muadib is not as other men, they would say. There can be no more doubt. He is a man, yet he sees through the water of life in the way of a reverend mother. He is indeed the Lisan al-Gaib. And Cheney is not put off by it. Just saying. The guild's protecting us, Jessica asked. Protecting us? The guild itself caused this by spreading tales about what we do here and by reducing troop transport fares to a point where even the poorest houses are up there waiting to loot us. If I were the Baron, I would be so pissed that the guild charged him so much to get his troops and the Sardaukar to Arrakis. Jessica noted the lack of bitterness in his tone, wondered at it. She couldn't doubt his words. They had the same intensity she had seen in him the night he'd revealed the path of the future that taken them among the Fremen. It is interesting that she's putting responsibility of it on Paul. She worked the Missionaria Protectiva before they were ousted from the castle. Cheney put a hand to her mouth, chalked to numb silence by the blasphemy pouring from Paul's lips. The blasphemy is the suggestion that Paul knows how to destroy all spies by destroying all sandworms. This would have a stronger effect if Paul hadn't been speculating on power via destruction quite a long time ago. They're searching for me, Paul said. Think of that. The finest guild navigators, men who can quest ahead through time to find the safest course for the fastest highliners, all of them seeking me and unable to find me. How they tremble. They know I have their secret here. Paul held out his cupped hand. Without the spice, they're blind. I acutely felt that the drama didn't hit because this is mentioned very early in the miniseries. I do wonder how they handle it in the major motion picture. Chapter 46 The Day of Reckoning has arrived. There's a plan to trap the Emperor on the surface, utilizing the nature of Arrakis along with nuclear weapons. It goes off without a hitch, but in the end we learn that the Emperor has killed Paul and Cheney's son and kidnapped Alia. Both Leto II and Alia was in the care of Hera, absent Cheney. So I want to know what happened to Hera. She would not have given them up without a fight. At least. We don't find out in this book what happened to her. And that day dawned when Arrakis lay at the hub of the universe with the wheel poised to spin. Very nice poeticism from Eruin. It wasn't the lighter that excited Stilgar's awe, Paul knew but the construction for which the lighter was only the center post. A single metal hutment, many stories tall, reached out in a thousand meter circle from the base of the lighter, a tent composed of interlocking metal leaves, the temporary lodging place for five legions of Sardikar and his imperial majesty, the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV. I am thrilled and amazed that hutment is a real word. It's very clever because the Sardaukar is comparable to the military, and within the military, a hutment is a prefabricated portable army housing unit, usually made of plywood and accommodating 16 to 20 men. 
or five legions of Sardaukar. Paul swung the telescope to scan the far wall of the basin, seeing the pockmarked cliffs, the slides that marked the tombs of so many of his father's troops. And he had a momentary sense of the fitness of things that the shades of those men should look down on this moment. Nice use of pockmarked. The Harkonnen forts and towns across the shielded lands lay in Fremen hands or cut away from their source, like stalks severed from a plant and left to wither. Only this basin and its city remain to the enemy. It's encouraging for me, as a writer, that Herbert skips over most of the brilliant military strategy offered by Paul. Don't sweat the details, guys. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Then he slid backward around a scarp of rock. Nice description. He felt time creeping like an insect working its way across an exposed rock. Nice simile. A slow wolfish grin spread across Gurney's face, the teeth showing white above the chip cut of his still suit. It glooms me much to think on all the poor Harkonnen souls will dispatch unshriven, he said. I don't know what a ship cut is, but nice use of unshriven. The Sardaukar have played into our hands. They grabbed some city women for their sport. <clears throat> Feeling a little tickle again decorated their battle standards with the heads of the men who objected, and they've built up a fever of hate among people who otherwise would have looked on the coming battle as no more than a great inconvenience, and the possibility of exchanging one set of masters for another. The Sardaukar recruit for us, Stilgar. They were told the odds, Paul said. They know every Sardaukar they kill will be one less for us. You see, gentlemen, they have something to die for. They've discovered they've a people. They're awakening. I don't think having a grand number of deaths is the best way to awaken to that fact. It shows how different Pa is from Leto, who was upset over the thought of losing a few men to a sandworm. It's my storm, Paul said, and saw the silent awe on the faces of the Fedaikin who heard him. Though it shook the entire world, it could not be more than I wished. If you want to believe something dearly enough, you see signs of it everywhere. In the abrupt silence, Paul heard the wind devils playing overhead, the front of the storm. Sand began to drift down into their bowl through gaps in the cover. A burst of wind caught the cover, whipped it away. Another nice description. It seemed that a full second passed before they felt the ground beneath them ripple and shake. A rumbling sound was added to the storm's roar. Lovely. My son is dead, Paul said, and knew as he spoke that it was true. My son is dead, and Alia is captive, hostage. He felt emptied, a shell without emotions. Everything he touched brought death and grief, and it was like a disease that could spread across the universe. Obviously, horribly tragic. But also illustrative that though Paul has been against his terrible purpose from the beginning, even he will have a tipping point. He could feel the old man wisdom, the accumulation out of the experiences from countless possible lives. Something seemed to chuckle and rub its hands within him, and Paul thought how little the universe knows about the nature of real cruelty. Just like Jessica feels the presence of previous reverend mothers, Paul has the echoes of other people in him, though it's very unclear who that would be. Or it's like all the possible futures he has experienced that won't come to pass. Maybe. Chapter 47. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. It looks like we won't make it to the funny number. I guess you have to stay tuned for the next video for that. The Emperor confronts the Baron about the survival of Paul and Jessica, briefly considering that there might have been a secret alliance between the Harkonnen and Atreides. This is the first scene with the Emperor, apart from the chapter intros. It's interesting that he's been built up over the whole book without actually being in it. Also. Alia kills the Baron Harkonnen after facing down the Reverend Mother. 
The Baron Vladimir Harkonnen stood with eyes downcast in the imperial audience chamber, the oval salamlik within the Padisha Emperor's hutment. According to Wikipedia, the salamlik was the portion of an Ottoman palace or house reserved for men, which isn't the case here. It was also the portion of the house where guests might be received and entertained, similar to the Andron or Andronites courtyard of men in ancient Greece. Pages brought the throne. It was a massive chair carved from a single piece of Hagal quartz. Blue-green translucency shot through with streaks of yellow fire. Who doesn't travel with a massive green throne? An old woman, in a black abba robe, with hood drawn down over her forehead, detached herself from the emperor's suite, took up station behind the throne, one scrawny hand resting on the quartz back. Her face peered out of the hood like a witch caricature, sunken cheeks and eyes, an overlong nose, skin mottled and with protruding veins. It's a very nice description. The Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother is so terribly different from the miniseries, but I don't dislike it. Uh, she is, I get the feeling that she is so powerful that she doesn't need to be decorated. It's also interesting to see hers and the Emperor's dynamic, because they seem very in tune with each other. The Emperor had deigned to notice him. The voice was baritone and with exquisite control. It managed to dismiss him while greeting him. Yes, the Emperor is not a nice character, living up to everything said about him, and it's nice to see the Baron made to be as small as he deserves. The Baron lowered his gaze, frightened by the Imperial anger. The delicacy of his position here, alone and dependent upon the convention and the dictum familia of the great houses, fretted him. Nice use of fretted. And it's interesting to see him being unhappy depending on the power of the great houses when he before meant to use the same thing against the emperor. He brings pages, the baron thought, and useless court lackeys, his women and their companions, hairdressers, designers, everything, all the fringe parasites of the court. Nice use of fringe parasites, and there used to be a typo in this line, Just FYI. Even the old Bene Gesserit truth-sayer drew back as the child passed and made a warding sign in her direction. The old witch obviously was shaken by the child's presence. At first I thought it was Alia who did the warding sign because she's been shown to have an irreverent nature, but it's actually the reverend mother. The child sat down on the dais beside the throne, dangled her feet over the edge, kicking them. There was such an air of sureness in the way she appraised her surroundings. Alia is even more unsettling because she sometimes acts like a child. The Baron stared at the kicking feet, the way they moved the black robe, the wink of sandals beneath the fabric. Nice use of wink of sandals. My star Dakar used the attitudinal yes on the carriers as flamethrowers, the Emperor said. Nice use of attitudinal. That child is an abomination, the old woman said. Her mother deserves a punishment greater than anything in history. Death. It cannot come too quickly for that child or for the one who spawned her. The old woman pointed a finger at Alia. Get out of my mind. Apparently, any hint of telepathy is seen as akin to a crime. But it's actually that Alia can share rapport with the consciousness of any reverend mother because she went through the same process in utero. You babble, old woman, Alia said. You don't know how it was, yet you rattle on like a purblind fool. Purblind is another new word for me, which means wholly or partly blind, literally or figuratively. My brother comes now, Alia said. Even an emperor may tremble before Muad'Dib, for he has the strength of righteousness and heaven smiles upon him. I have a very clear picture of Alia creepily declaring, my brother comes in that poltergeist kind of way. A small black robed figure could be seen momentarily against the light, Alia darting out to find a knife and, as befitted her Fremen training, to kill Harkonnen and Sardaukar wounded. Which is tragic, of course. 
And when Jessica learns of it in the next chapter, she seems insulted that her daughter does what Fremen children do. Also, I'm questioning the practicality of killing the wounded. Isn't it better to let them stay alive as far as possible as to keep their water fresh for as long as possible? You know, I'm just trying to think like a Fremen. A dust cloud hung low over the outside world, blowing from pastel distances. Static lightning crackled from the cloud, and the spark flashes of shields being shorted out by the storm's charge could be seen through the haze. The plane surged with figures in combat, Sardaukar and leaping, gyrating, robed men who seemed to come down out of the storm. Cool. Out of the sand haze came an orderly mass of flashing shapes. Great rising curves with crystal spokes that resolved into gaping mouths of sandworms. A masked wall of them, each with troops of Fremen riding to the attack. They came in a hissing wedge, ropes whipping in the wind as they cut through the melee on the plain. Really cool. And I believe I ac I've accidentally seen that clip from some sort of promo for the movie. Onward toward the Emperor's hutment they came, while the House Sardaukar stood awed for the first time in their history by an onslaught their minds found difficult to accept. Which is a nice turnaround since Hawat was stunned by how many Sardaukar attacked the Atreides. The taller of the two, though, held a hand to his left eye. As the Emperor watched, someone jostled the guildsman's arm. The hand moved and the eye was revealed. The man had lost one of his masking contact lenses, and the eye stared out a total blow so dark as to be almost black. This feels like it's supposed to be a dramatic reveal, but I've already told you why it isn't to me. They're not neon blue, at least. She pulled the hood from her face, met his gaze with an unblinking stare. The look that passed between them carried complete understanding. They had one weapon left and both knew it. Treachery. This seems to be a common weapon for the Emperor, I feel. Chapter 48. The final chapter. Pa has reclaimed the castle he was driven from. And Jessica tries to disavow responsibility for how Paul turned out, which is pretty rich. You have to agree. She admits having a hand in it. But I, she's the reason that he is what he is. She could reasonably have said that she expected the Kwisatz Hadrak to be something different. But she is responsible regardless, as she is for him becoming a leader among the Fremen. He has consistently shown a stronger moral backbone than she has. Even though he did order drums to be made out of Harkonnen soldiers' skins. Yeah, whatever. Paul confronts the Emperor and the Spacing Guild, threatening to destroy all spies if the Emperor doesn't wed Irulan to him, thus making Paul into the next Emperor. The Emperor first refuses, and then Fade calls on the blood feud between houses. There is a duel, throughout which Fade sheets like the dirty cheater he is, but Paul prevails. Count Fenring refuses to kill Paul for his friend the Emperor. In the end, the Emperor will be condemned to Seleucus Secundus, which will be disarmed, as Paul will claim all of the Emperor's chairs at, in Chaum as a dowry. But Paul could only focus his attention on the inner eye and the gaps visible to him in the time wall that still lay across his path. Through each gap, the Yi had reached away down the corridors of the future. I like Time Wall here, and it's it's fascinating to me how Herbert manages to describe the same thing in different ways and still be cohesive. Of all the uses of time vision, this was the strangest. I have breasted the future to place my words where only you can hear them, Alia had said. Even you cannot do that, my brother. I find it an interesting play. And, oh yes, I have killed our grandfather, the demented old baron. He had very little pain. This feels a little bit overpowered, but considering everything, why not? He seemed too submissive to Paul, 
But then the Sardaukar had never been prepared for such happenings as this day. They'd never known anything but victory, which, Paul realized, could be a weakness in itself. He put that thought aside for later consideration in his own training program. There must be a whole lot of Sardaukar. If there are some of them which have not experienced being humbled by Fremen at this point. Which makes sense, I guess. I have a message for you to carry to the Emperor, Paul said. And he couched his words in the ancient formula. Nice use of couched. In that instant, Paul saw how Stilgar had been transformed from the Fremen Naib to a creature of the Lisan al Gaib, a receptacle for awe and obedience. It was a lessening of the man, and Paul felt the ghost wind of the Yihad in it. I have seen a friend become a worshipper, he thought. Paul is such a tragic figure, and his powers are extremely well handled. He is still a believable, sympathetic character. I know I have said that a few times by now, but I still feel it quite intensely. Muadib, from whom all blessings flow, he thought, and it was the bitterest thought of his life. They sense that I must take the throne, he thought, but they cannot know I do it to prevent the jihad. Just imagine how stressful all of Paul's life will be, because just like the emperor, he can't entirely disarm his main source of military power, but he must always be wary that they don't get out of hand. Jessica stopped in front of Paul, looked down at him. She saw his fatigue and how he hid it, but found no compassion for him. It was as though she had been rendered incapable of any emotion for her son. As I said, rich. She does not come off well in this final chapter. Jessica had entered the great hall, wondering why the place refused to fit itself snugly into her memories. It remained a foreign room, as though she had never walked here, never walked here with her beloved Leto, never confronted a drunken Duncan Idaho here, never, never, never. It's interesting with a space between in and to, but also she's been romanticizing it since it happened, so naturally it doesn't fit. Paul saw the marks of tears on her cheeks. Cheney's cheeks, that is. She gives water to the dead. He felt a pang of grief strike through him, but it was as though he could only feel this thing through Cheney's presence. Yeah, it's so sad. It's a repetition of not being able to grieve for his father. And worse, of course. And he thought then about the guild, the force that had specialized for so long that it had become a parasite unable to exist independently of the life upon which it fed. Nice use of parasite. He looked beyond Fade Rautha then, attracted by a movement, seeing there a narrow weaselish face he'd never before encountered, not in time or out of it. It was a face he felt he should know, and the feeling carried with it a marker of fear. I really hope that Fenring is an active character in the coming books, because he... He interests me a, a lot, especially as he is portrayed in this final chapter. It occurred to Paul then that he had seen his own dead body along countless reaches of the time web, but never once had seen his moment of death. Have I been denied a glimpse of this man because he is the one who kills me? Paul wondered. I was fascinated by this because it kind of feels like, almost like, there has to be intent behind the verb deny. Someone has to choose to do it. But who would that be in this context? I can't really think of anything, so I find it intriguing. Paul's attention came at last to a tall blonde, green-eyed, a face of patrician beauty, classic in its hauteur, untouched by tears, completely undefeated. Without being told it, Paul knew her. Princess Royal, Bene Gesserit trained, a face that time vision had shown him in many aspects, Irulan. Nice use of hotter. A look of deadly waiting held the Emperor's face now. Eyes that had never admitted fear admitted it at last. Nice use of deadly waiting. The eye that looks ahead to the safest course is closed forever, Paul said. 
The guild is crippled. Humans become little isolated clusters on their isolated planets. You know, I might do this thing out of pure spite or out of ennui. Yeah, it's really not optimal to have one person standing in the way of total catastrophe. Even your Bene Gesserit truth sayer is trembling, Paul said. There are other poison the Reverend Mothers can use for their tricks, but once they've used the spice liquor, the others no longer work. It's really interesting to imagine what would happen to Paul in that instance. Well, he would probably be bombed out from space, you know, out of spite. Paul glared at the old woman. For your part in all this, I could gladly have you strangled, he said. You couldn't prevent it, he snapped as she stiffened in rage. But I think it's better punishment that you live out your years, never able to touch me or bend me to a single thing your scheming desires. I wonder when it will be time for the next Kwisatz Hadrak. The Bene Gesserit are patient. Silence, Paul roared. The words seemed to take substance as it twisted through the air between them under Paul's control. Nice use of take substance. You've had your day against them, Paul said, and he felt a Harlequin abandon take over his emotions. Nice use of Harlequin abandon. The Emperor was studying Fade Rautha, seeing the heavy shoulders, the thick muscles. He turned to look at Paul, a stringy whipcord of a youth, not as desiccated as the Arakin natives, but with ribs there to count, and sunken in the flanks, so that the rippling gather of muscles could be followed under the skin. Appearances are deceptive, and it's about perspective here. I'm sure Fremen would look at Fade and think he's too soft with water. Jessica hid her face in her hands, realizing that she did not know fully why Paul took this course. She could feel death in the room and knew that the changed Paul was capable of such a thing as Gurney suggested. Every talent within her focused on the need to protect her son, but there was nothing she could do. Make up your mind, woman. Can you have emotions for him or not? Is it enough that he's alive, but it doesn't matter if he's happy? Hmm? A flurry of robes, scraping of feet, low-voiced commands and protests accompanied obedience to Paul's command. Nice use of low-voiced commands. Even the faint gaps were closed now. Here was the unborn jihad he knew. Here was the race consciousness that he had known once as his own terrible purpose. Here was reason enough for a Kwisat Hadrak or a Lisan al Gaib, or even the halting schemes of the Bene Gesserit. The race of humans had felt its own dormancy, sensed itself grown stale, and knew now only the need to experience turmoil in which the genes would mingle and the strong new mixture survive. All humans were alive as an unconscious single organism in this moment, experiencing a kind of sexual heat that would override any barrier. I'm not sure that I accept that mankind as a whole ever does what is good for mankind as a whole. And Paul saw how futile were any efforts of his to change any smallest bit of this. He had thought to oppose the Yehad within himself what the Yehad would be. His legions would rage out from Arrakis even without him. They needed only the legend he already had become. He had shown them the way, given them mastery even over the guild which must have the spies to exist. I'm not sure if this means that Paul is giving up on stopping the war. I wouldn't think so. A sense of failure pervaded him, and he saw through it that Fade Rausa Harkonnen had slipped out of the torn uniform, stripped down to a fighting girdle with a male core. I don't know what a male core means here, but it sounds cool. This is the climax, Paul thought. From here, the future will open, the clouds part onto a kind of glory. And if I die here, they'll say I'll sacrifice myself that my spirit might lead them. And if I live, they'll say nothing can oppose Muadib. Shall we fight, cousin? Paul asked. And he cat-footed forward, eyes on the waiting blade, his body crouched low with his own milk-white crisp knife pointing out as though an extension of his arm. Nice use of cat-footed. She, the reverend mother, had seen something of what Paul had seen here, that Fade Rausa might kill but not be victorious. 
Another thought, though, almost overwhelmed her. Two end products of this long and costly program faced each other in a fight to the death that might easily claim both of them. If both died here, that would leave only Fade Rautha's bastard daughter, still a baby, an unknown, an unmeasured factor, and Alia the Abomination. Which is another alternative, very interesting storyline to imagine. Fade Rautha matched Paul's cold smile, lifted blade in left hand from mock salute. His eyes glared rage behind the knife. Nice use of glared rage. Paul strained. Hearing the silent screams in his mind, his cell-stamped ancestors demanding that he use the secret word to slow Fade Rautha to save himself. Super interesting that the ancestors are communicating. Also, Paul doesn't cheat, but still defeats Fade. Paul, aware of some of this from the way the time nexus boiled, understood at last why he had never seen Fendring along the webs of prescience. Fendring was one of the might have beens and almost Kwisatz Haderach, crippled by a flaw in the genetic pattern, a eunuch whose talent concentrated into furtiveness and inner seclusion. A deep compassion for the Count flowed through Paul, the first sense of brotherhood he'd ever experienced. Tragic. The Emperor straightened, standing stiffly with a look of remembered dignity. Still having some dignity is good for him, I guess, seeing how Paul intends to imprison him on Seleucus Secundus while disarming the Sardaukar by turning the planet into a paradise. Way to threaten someone with a good time, I guess. I know the reasons, Cheney whispered. If it must be, Usul. Paul, hearing the secret tears in her voice, touched her cheek. My Sihaya need fear nothing ever. I'm glad that she doesn't have to sacrifice because she's already going through hell as is. Jessica sends the harsh calculation in her son, puts down a shudder. What are your instructions? she asked. Until very recently. She has always been adamant that he would have to be calculating in his choice of wife, wanting Cheney out of the picture to that end. Now she shudders at seeing it. I would like Jessica to make up her mind about whether she cares at all about her son. But it won't happen in this book. And now I'm going to read the last few passages for you and to tell you what I think about them. No title for me, Cheney whispered. Nothing, I beg of you. Paul stared down into her eyes, remembering her suddenly as she had stood once with little Leto in her arms, their child now dead in this violence. I swear to you now, he whispered, that you'll need no title. That woman over there will be my wife and you but a concubine because this is a political thing and we must weld peace out of this moment and list the great houses of the Landsrad. We must obey the forms. Yet that princess shall have no more of me than my name. No child of mine, nor touch, nor softness of glance, nor instant of desire. So you say now, Cheney said. She glanced across the room at the tall princess. Do you know so little of my son, Jessica whispered. See that princess standing there, so haughty and confident. They say she has pretensions of a literary nature. Let us hope she finds solace in such things. She'll have little else. A bitter laugh escaped Jessica. Think on it, Cheney. That princess will have the name, yet she'll live as less than a concubine, never to know a moment of tenderness from the man to whom she's bound. While we, Cheney, we who carry the name of concubine, history will call us wives. It is really sweet, the affirmation of Paul's relationship with Cheney. And, you know, the, the concubine wife dilemma has been a theme throughout the book but I also feel intensely bad for Irulin. She isn't an active character but you do feel some kind of way about her built up over all of the quotes from her. None of this is her fault and it seems like she's going to be treated coldly by the person with the most power over her and she definitely doesn't deserve what feels like resentment from Jessica. Even more, 
because of how complementary Irulan is of both of them, and it makes me question whether she was complementary in the hope of softening their treatment of her. But that's just speculation at this point. And that's it. The end. Apart from, well, there are appendices, but they don't count. In my book, I'm not a fan of appendices in fiction. Anyway, I do feel the same thing now as I did, as I probably did the first time I read it. And that's that there's a fullness to the story, it, a completed circle. It could end here. Leto is avenged and surpassed. Paul is, has confronted his counterpart and won in, in ritual combat. And he has regained his power from the Reverend Mother. The one in your face, Lou's end, is Fade's infant daughter and the maybe holy war coming from the Fremen. But I, I'm not the right person to ask about that because I rarely experience a need to find out what happens next. Like, I really enjoy the Green Rider series by Kristen Brittain. And I got the seventh book in the series last Christmas. It's up here. And I really do want to read it, but I haven't been in the right mood for it yet. When I do get into the mood, I will probably want to reread the first six. Again, do let me know if you would like to see a micro appreciation on the Green Rider series. I will happily deliver that. And well, if you go back to the book in question, Dune, the book is much better than the miniseries because of the added complexity of the story as expected from a book versus an adaptation. And I, I think I will see the new major motion pictures when I'm done reading Herbert, whether that is because I have read all of them or because I've gotten bored, that is more likely to happen. But I promise I will do the second and third book at least. And then we'll see. When I'm finished, I probably want to sit with my feelings about from the text before I go to the movie's adaptation. But then I could possibility for another video there to make a sort of comparison between the books and the movies. Wouldn't that be interesting? Comment down below. So we're finished, finally. Well done watching and quite well done to me for finishing all in one night. It is quite late. Um, oh, what did you think about Dune? Have you read it? Did I miss your favorite part? Comment down below. I did put a lot of work into this massive first video. So if you like it, please leave a like and subscribe if you would like to see more micro appreciation content from me. At the time of upload, I, I'm planning to be already working on the second video, but a little encouragement won't go down wrong. Share it with your friends if you're so inclined, especially since this video might get restricted or something, I don't know. Very exciting to see what happens. And yeah, that's about it. And just for fun, let's end this off with some vocabulary appreciation because we always want to expand our active vocabulary. I don't want to show off, but I am subscribed to Marion Webster's unabridged and collegiate dictionaries. Don't be jealous, you can be too. If I ever see the day when I'm sponsored by Marion Webster, I'll consider my fortune made. I would have to think of some real milestone shenanigans for that one, if it comes to pass. But here are the words that made it to my vocab training list. Gestalten, Graben, Circes, Megalopolis, Propertied, Yuba, Epicanthic Fold, Pyretic, Scarp, Compact, Covey, Bite, 
either burn news, baffle, strike, sill, heft, guiden, distaff, corruptment, erg, hutment, purblind. Thanks for watching. Bye. Maybe. And this is just me spitballing here. But maybe if I had subscribers, I would be a hint less awkward. Because then I would be talking to someone rather than to myself all night. Which feels a hint weird. And it, it is very late by now. It's 4 o'clock a.m. I've been filming for a very long time and I've almost finished off my third energy drink. So you don't have to take anything I'm saying seriously at this point. But if you were to subscribe and come back for the next one, I'm sure that would be better. Or I hope it would be better. We could find out together. Um, and yeah, thank you for actually watching to the end. It's more than I could ever expect. Okay, bye for real now. <laughs>